It is recording. Okay. All right, great. I'm going to be, uh, um, yeah, taking myself off, off camera, but I'll be uh, silently sitting here. Great, uh, thank you. Me. Thanks. Hi, Jake. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Good, good. How's your new computer working out? So good. Oh, good. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, what a difference, huh? Yeah. I still haven't moved over a bunch of files, but I'm tempted to just leave them living on my hard drive and start fresh. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a hassle. Um, that's a hassle. I, we, we have like at home and I have one here, like the external hard drives that you, you know, for yeah. $70, you get like more memory than you'll ever use and just dump everything onto it. And 
Yeah, we we might be a little psycho about that. We have, you know, we have our backup, and then we have a backup of the backup that we keep someplace else. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I forget that your husband actually, you know, and and you actually from your background know what you're doing as a. <laughs> <laughs> As opposed to my family that just dumps everything with no order onto these external hard drives. And yeah, well, at least they're there. So maybe you could find something you were looking for at some point with with much uh, frustration, I'm sure. Maybe. <laughs> uh, phew. I wonder if I should mute Jack. I wonder if he doesn't realize he's not on mute. I always feel bad doing that. I know it does feel a little. Uh... <laughs> hey, Joe. Hello. <laughs> <sighs> Christina, you look so calm. Oh, thanks. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> Oh, this it's, is recording it's probably, too. It's probably the filter on my new computer. It's the calming filter. <laughs> oh, all the bad Zoom jokes that we could have for the year. <laughs> have to love technology. Especially this year. Mm hmm. Hi, Carrie. Stephen, are you there? I am there. I have a very bad internet connection where I am. So, okay. given that I'm going to be spending most of my time typing. <laughs> <laughs> the happy typist. <laughs> it is a Sorry, useful skill to be able to type in real time. Y yeah, you're, um, you know, um, the, the I, the I Berkshire, I Berkshire's reporter that covered Pittsfield, Andy McKeever, would do that, and I was, I would find myself distracted in meetings because I was watching him type, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and was envious. <laughs> well, what's interesting is, is I, I learned how to type on a typewriter. Wow! In typewriting class in high school, the IB, the I IBM too. Selectric with the ball, right? I yeah. have one of those in my office. <laughs> I actually first learned on an Underwood, which was a clunk, clunk, clunk. Didn't no electric uh, component to it. Graduated to an IBM. <laughs> uh, My kids do not understand when I tell them I did not have a computer in college. Like that just doesn't, that does not make any sense to them. Do your kids know what QWERTY stands for? that this was done to slow down typists. Really? Right, because what happened is on the old typewriters, if you hit keys in quick succession, they would often jam. So this is True. to make you alternate between left hand, right hand. It's designed to be inefficient. Wow. <laughs> and we are stuck with it. I have never heard that. I made it just in the nick of time. <laughs> We're sharing typewriter stories. Oh, that's how I learned to type. A S D F J K L semi return. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it well. I hated the little white paper you had to put in to make a correction. 
Oh, oh that's yeah. right. You could only have so many mistakes per page before they would make you redo it. <laughs> so to be fair, I'm an excellent typer. So I think that has something to do with it. Wow. Like hey, my husband's most... this guy. One of the most useful classes I took in, in high school. There's Jose. Hi, Jose. We are just waiting for Curtis. And it's the his library birthday, told me it's his birthday today. <laughs> oh. So as soon as he jumps on, we'll get started. I'll give him, it's six o'clock now, so I'll, I'll give him a birthday. I'll give him a birthday minute. Rough crowd. Charlie, it's nice to see you. This is the third time I've seen you on a Zoom meeting. At some point, I would actually like to meet you. And uh, someday that will happen. But uh, thanks for joining us. I hope so. Yeah. Thanks yeah. so much for having me. Michelle, do you have Curtis's contact information? I do. He used to be my backyard neighbor. And he buys eggs from us. Happy birthday, Curtis. Hello. Oh, there he is. There Happy he birthday. Is. Happy birthday. Oh, dear God. <laughs> I mean, thank you. Uh, for my birthday, uh, as much brevity as you can squeeze it out of yourselves. Uh, I was hoping you would wish for that. Of course, <laughs> that's typing. literally every day. <laughs> okay, so the full committee is here, so I will call this meeting to order. I'd like to call the Mount Greylock Regional School District School Committee to order. It is 6.01 p.m. Tuesday, December 22nd, 2020. We are meeting remotely via Zoom. Per Governor Baker's order, suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, MGL C30A, Section 20, the public will not be allowed to physically access this school committee meeting. At Mount Greylock Regional School District, our mission is to create a community of learners working together in a safe and challenging learning environment that encourages restorative-based processes, respect, inclusive diversity, courtesy, integrity, and responsibility through high expectations and cooperation resulting in lifelong learning and personal growth. Next up on our agenda is public comment. We currently have three commenters signed up, two are emails that I will read aloud and um, one person I will call on when it is her turn. Uh, the first public comment is from Stephen Dravis. Dear school committee, please reconsider the district practice of not posting supporting material for the committee's deliberations, i.e. the packet, until after a meeting has occurred. As you know, district policy requires members of the public who wish to speak to submit comments two hours before a virtual meeting or to sign up to comment at an in-person meeting before it begins. Denying people the ability to make informed comments serves no public purpose. When packets were printed on paper, it made sense to limit pre-meeting distribution to the committee members. It is 2020 and you have the capability to publish non-sensitive materials online well in advance of meetings. The only possible reason not to do so is to prevent robust public discourse. That may be the goal of some school committee members. I am not sure it is a goal shared by your constituents. Respectfully, Stephen Dravis, Williamstown resident. And Kathy Keating is next up for public comment. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. So you just introduced me, you know who I am. Um, I just wanted to comment on agenda item 15. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate my support for return to in-person learning uh, on a more substantial level as soon as possible for the Mount Greylock Regional School District. I feel that the COVID-19 numbers in our community do not necessitate remote learning at this time. I am by no means a public health expert, but if you re 
view the percent positivity rates for our town since school started. They are just not that impressive. From the little amount of research I've done on various guidelines across the country, 5% positivity seems to be a reasonable cutoff for switching to remote learning. There's only one week where the number went over that and it was only in one town. Just all the school committee members get the email I sent with the little, the numbers, okay. For the three weeks where Williamstown was in the yellow category, two of those weeks were because of a small outbreak of COVID at Pine Cobble. And the other more recent one was because of increased numbers at Williamstown Commons, the long-term care facility in Williamstown. I don't believe either of those clusters really threatens the health of our teachers or students at any of our three schools. I would just like someone to explain to me why after reading the percent positivity rates for our towns, why the majority of our children are doing completely remote learning. Those children and families are suffering the consequences of this, which I already discussed at the last meeting I presented at. Oh, where'd my video go? I would also imagine there are many teachers in our district who would support a return to more in-person learning as well from the teachers I've spoken with in our district and other districts. Uh, I only hear that this is an exceedingly difficult task that they're being asked to do. I would implore this committee to embrace a public health perspective when recommending guidelines for returning to school. Fear, anxiety, and political pressures should not be where guidelines come from. Guidelines should be formed with the advice of public health experts as this is a public health crisis a crisis that we are only making worse by using remote learning when we don't need to. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Thank you. Yep. Our next public comment comes from Allison Carter. Dear school committee, as a child, the sports field was where I learned some of life's greatest skills, teamwork, leadership, decision-making, commitment, determination, communication, self-confidence. As a community member and parent, I hear so many stories about our athletic programs and the life skill building and joy they bring to our students, and also how our current infrastructure is insufficient for Mount Greylock's athletic needs. This is why previous subcommittees prioritized a new playing field on top of the improvements necessary to bring current facilities into compliance with Title IX and ADA requirements. And the analysis conducted by the phase two subcommittee led them to favor a Brockville turf field over a new grass field for a number of specific readings, reasons, including that a grass field is likely more expensive than a turf field over the turf's lifespan. Thanks to the gift from Williams College, the school committee is in a position to not only provide our students with increased opportunities for athletics and the learning experiences that come with them, but also set aside a million in renewal fund to help offset costs of major school needs in the future reducing the burden on our towns and taxpayers. How amazing is that? What an incredible opportunity for our children, the district and our communities. I encourage you to support the efforts of the phase two subcommittee and move forward with the bidding process for a Brockville field with the knowledge that your support will positively impact the lives of our students for years to come. Sincerely, Allie Carter, Williamstown, parent of three and 2018-2020 school committee member. And I do not see any other public comment. So we will move on to the next agenda item, which is approval of minutes. First up, we have the December 8, 2020 minutes. Do I have a motion to approve the December 8, 2020 minutes? So move. Curtis moves. Do I have a second? I'll second. Michelle seconds, any discussion? Julia? Uh, it, it may not be a, a big thing, but I felt like it was an important thing at the last meeting that may not have been clear in these minutes under the educational update. Um, I don't believe I asked about creative ways to involve students in a virtual way. I believe I was that was in direct response to Kathy Keating's comments at the last meeting, speaking of mental health and asking for are there creative ways um, not to involve students, but to engage with students uh, through, the, through the day. And I think it's important to note that Superintendent McCandless responded with the fact that they were looking at 
um, potential sources for mental health supports for students in a remote environment. I think that's, um, I just want it noted that there are efforts being made, um, not as good as being in person for sure, but efforts being made. Thank you. Okay, with those notes, any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, all in favor, roll call alphabetically by last name. Owen, I. Conry, I. Constantine, I. Open by an I. Green, I. Johnson, I. Miller, I. Okay, those minutes pass, thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the December 14th, 2020 minutes? So move, I, can, we, we, can we approve them both or do we need to take them individually? Uh, December 14th? Um, There's two sessions. Let's, the, there are two sessions. So let me, let me um, amend a <laughs> motion to, um, do I have a motion to approve the December 14th, 2020 public comment session minutes? So moved. Julia moves, do I have a second? Second. Curtis seconds, any discussion? Okay, hearing none, all in favor? Bowen, aye. Conry, aye. Constantine, aye. Elfenbein, aye. Green, aye. Johnson, aye. Miller, I. Okay, thank you. Those minutes pass. Do I have a motion to approve the December 14th, 2020 presentation questions session minutes? So moved. John, Michelle moved, so I have a second. Second. Julia seconds. Any discussion? I just have a question. Yeah. Did, did we ever get the actual presentations? Yes, I believe we did. Okay. Um, but let me, let me just mark that question in my notes and look into it and make sure that they were distributed to everybody. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, all in favor? Owen, aye. Connery, aye. Constantine, aye. Elfenbein, aye. Green, aye. Johnson, aye. Miller, aye. Thank you, that motion passes. Okay, next up on our agenda is student representative updates and I'm gonna turn it over to Charlie McQueenie. Thank you, yeah. Charlie. Thanks so much. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Charlie. Uh, I'm a senior at Mount Greylock uh, and I serve on our student council. Um, I'm super happy to be here tonight. Um, first of all, I wanna extend a huge thank you um, on behalf of the entire student council to everyone who's been working so hard um, to make this school year in such a unique circumstance work um, from our you know, initial remote learning period to the transition to hybrid, um, back to remote, to all the school committee members, to the teachers, to the administrators um, and athletic directors and custodial staff um, who cleaned the building um, and all played their role. Um, We're incredibly grateful. So thank you for that. Um, as, a, as our council, our first order of business this year um, was kind of getting elections up and running. Uh, usually those are held at the end in the spring of the year. Um, that obviously didn't end up happening because of COVID, um, but we, we recognize the importance of having student voices um, in decision-making processes this year, especially. Um, so we now have 20 uh, 20 student council members and three students uh, representing student perspectives on the school council. Um, so we've, we kind of did some internal housekeeping along with that stuff. Um, one of the issues we spent some time with recently um, was web access um, on the school issued Chromebooks. Um, this is something we got to meet with the technology director, Ms. Kotz, um, with, which we had a super great conversation with her. Um, but we recognize that with the move to more remote learning, um, you know, lots of stuff is happening on uh, Chromebooks that the school has issued. 
Um, and we wanted to make sure that students had access to all the websites they needed to, um, to successfully complete that learning. Um, so we had a great conversation with Ms. Kotz um, and we are, we're looking forward to uh, setting up um, some new opportunities for collaboration between the student council um, on issues of technology. Um, something else we've we've been talking about least lately with the transition to the fully remote learning model um, have kind of been the increase in the amount of time students are having to spend on screens. Um, the fact that has you know on the health of students both physically with the eye strain, um, but also the mental health issues. Um, you know I've heard from a lot of students. Um, many students, I would say, are, are doing really well and thriving under a remote environment, and I want to recognize that. Um, and then there are also a lot of students um, who we've heard from who are really struggling, um, who are struggling to stay engaged in classes that are being held online, um, who are struggling, you know, with the, with the impacts of being isolated from their, from their peers, um, are struggling with keeping up with work um, when they're not directly in contact with their teachers. Um, and obviously there are, there are a lot of things we can do to address that. Um, so the school council uh, or the student council uh, had a meeting with Principal Schutz um, where we talked over uh, some of the ideas we had for kind of reducing strain on the eyes by taking breaks um, during classes just to kind of look away from screens, um, ways we can lessen the amount of homework that has to be done on a computer, um, you know, breaks we can take in the middle of the days, um, and those kinds of issues. Um, we talked about kind of the, the increase in support for teletherapy um, the school is looking at. Um, and I think it is, it's the hope of, of many students that we can return to a hybrid model or an in-person model um, as soon as we can safely do so and we feel confident doing that. Um, I would say a lot of students are, are, are struggling not having that in-person time, um, those, uh, those who, who, who choose to, to be enrolled in the, in the in-person section and not the remote academy, um, and, and hope that the, this committee um, will continue to look at and evaluate and reevaluate the, the standards we've set for remote learning um, as part of that, especially as, you know, hopefully in the in the coming months, um, teachers and other high-risk populations in the school um, will hopefully, you know, begin to get vaccines um, and recognizing the, the impact that will have on our ability to, to have students in school, whether that's part-time or full-time. Um, and then kind of as, as, as part of the, the mental health uh, side of this, uh, the student council organized an ugly sweater day, um, which was today before the holiday break. Um, we, we had a really amazing level of participation where students would come in um, in their best, their ugliest, their most creative, their most innovative holiday sweaters. Um, we, you know, we, we took the students send in pictures, we took those and we sent them off to a faculty panel of judges. So hopefully we'll be hearing results back from them soon. Um, so that was something that we found students were really engaged in and interested in. Um, and we we're happy to, to host and continue a, a past tradition. Um, and then one, one final thing we've, we've been talking about recently in a meeting with Mr. Schutz, um, in our, in our, uh, internal meetings. Um, are the, the, the district snow day policy. Um, I know a lot of, a lot of thought went into this um, and there, there are plans to hopefully um, have some, the possibility for some snow days after February break. Um, but a lot of students and frankly, teachers who, who we talked with um, too expressed a lot of remorse over the loss of snow days, uh, especially in a year that's as challenging as this one. Um, where you know that that little joy um, can 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 bring you a lot and help get through the winter, um, and and how you know especially in a in a year like this, um, we never want to be running you know in, late into June, um, but you know with the possibility of a, of a return to in person learning um, later in the year, you know I, there there are plenty of students who would rather take a day in June that was in person than a day sitting in front of their computer in their bedrooms um, in January and be able to kind of take a break, reset, spend spend some time playing outside in the snow, you know, safely distanced from friends, sledding, skiing, um, getting active. 
Um, and, you know, we, we, we noticed, you know, a couple of teachers who were having to, who had tech issues when teaching from home. Um, a couple of kids had teachers who were absent that day or were having to teach um, with their kids, which, you know, obviously is, is amazing that they can do, um, but that isn't something that they should have to be doing. I had a teacher who, because of uh, Wi-Fi issues at his house, ended up having to drive midway through the day to the school. Um, so that he could access it there um, and, you know, ex explain the, the, the tough time he had getting off the road into the parking lot. Um, so there, there are definitely some of those impacts too, but I think ultimately it's, it's largely a question of giving kids a little break, um, a time to, to reset um, in these unusual and difficult circumstances um, and then come back stronger and ready to, to learn and be engaged. Um, that's all I have for you guys tonight. I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has any, um, but thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Charlie, so much. Any questions from the committee for Charlie? Uh, this is Steve, one quick question. I know last year before COVID hit, there was discussion about the start of the day and trying to have a conversation countywide. We are you know, far away from that you know, being I think on the front burner, but is that something that's going to be looked at again this year? Yeah, that's a that's a great point. That's something the the student council, as as long as I remember, has always been interested in. Um, it definitely has not been at the front of our minds, um, given how complex the schedule for the school year is. Um, I think during when we were all entirely remote, we we brought it up um, just because it felt like a, a relatively easy change. Um, but now that kids are, are back in, some, some students are back in school, school as part of the Student Support Center or as part of special learning plans, um, that would obviously be more complex. But it's definitely something we are hoping to find time and space and energy to discuss for future years, um, just given you know, the, 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 the sleep deprivation many students are facing um, and lots of those issues. So yeah, I, I appreciate you bringing that up. That's certainly something we are hoping to, to return to. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions for Charlie? Okay, thanks again, Charlie. So next up on the agenda are the is the athletic director update. So I turn it over to Lindsay Von Holtz. Hello again, everybody. Um, I'm not sure I like following Charlie. He's always so well-spoken. Um, he did a great job. We, uh, let's see, on the co-curricular side, we had some students involved in the Fall Festival full of Shakespeare last week, and we also had our own Shakespeare performance, uh, but that group of students in-house has yet to decide if they want to put it out to the public yet. They've looked at it as a group, and they're still deciding whether they want it out, so if that happens, I will publish it. So others can see it, uh, but they did a great job with it. In the end, they had to do it all virtually, uh, but they ended up piecing together all of their own little clips, um, editing it and creating a show, which was pretty neat. I spoke a little bit about our pen pal program last meeting, and that is finally up and running. The student ambassador sat down today and we're pairing up students from the elementary schools with the high school students so that over the break, the high school students will start writing those letters to anybody who signed up and we will deliver them to the elementary schools and hope to, to get that going back and forth and eventually a, a big sibling, little sibling thing and maybe even meeting each other in the spring if that is at all possible. So that's kind of exciting. Athletically, we started practices last Monday. So we've been going for a week. Given the fact that we as a school were still in remote learning, we decided to add some modifications to the already modified um, sports. So we just spread everybody out a little bit more focused on individual ski skill work. So for our Nordic skiers, which we have 63 of, that probably did not impact them as much because skiing is pretty distant as it is, um, but they are staying more distant than they would have. And we've asked them to hold off on intra races at this point because they would be passing each other and doing things like that. So they're holding off on that until we are hopefully back in person or hybrid soon. We have 48 basketball players and right now they're practicing, each group is practicing twice a week 
Uh, so we have 12 students in the gym at a time, and that's been going incredibly well um, for the challenges of distance basketball. We have about two kids to a hoop. They're working on dribbling, shooting, um, conditioning. So a lot of individual ball work right now, no scrimmaging, no 2v2s, no game-like situations at this point, just individual skill work. Um, and so each group goes in for about an hour and a half, but we have limited it to 12 at a time in the gym, but that has gone very, very well um, as well. Great, thank you. Any questions from the committee for Lindsay? Okay, next up we have the director of- Christina, I oh. think Michelle had a question. Oh, sorry. I, I thought I unmuted myself and said that, but I didn't. Um, <laughs> Lindsay, um, I just have a question about the, um, is it the fitness program? Is that what I'm thinking M of? MGOAT? That one, yeah. yeah. <laughs> is that happening? Uh, Will that be happening? We, we definitely still want it to happen, um, but it's kind of contingent on the kids being in the building. And the way Coach Gill was thinking about running it is assuming we're hybrid. Um, the, the cohort A would meet on Monday and Tuesdays after school, and the cohort B would meet on uh, Thursdays and Fridays after school. If someone from cohort C was interested, we'd work out kind of the best placement number wise and things like that. Uh, but that's definitely something we would like to start after the new year, assuming we are back in the building. Thank you. I'm having mute issues tonight. Sorry. I'm ready for a holiday break. That's what I'm ready for. <laughs> Thank you. I don't see any other questions, Lindsay. Thank you very much. No problem, thank you. Okay, next up on the agenda is the Director of Curriculum and Instruction and Director of Academic Te Technology Updates. So I turn it over to Joelle Bruckner and Ellie Cox. Hello. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, thank you for having us. I'm going to tell you about three things happening in the curriculum world right now. One is I don't think we've ever really talked to school committee about our new teacher induction program, and we are well underway. We have 12 new teachers spread across pretty evenly across three schools, and um, each of those teachers, when they come into the district, is assigned a mentor. This is all based on Department of Ed regulations, and um, there's some leeway in terms of how schools structure their program, but this is how we work it. Um, so teachers meet on their own with mentors for all kinds of reasons, um, everything from building based practices to figuring out how to do report cards to um, troubleshooting things with students, um, and then we meet as a group together. So all of the new teachers come together once a month for an in induction program. Uh, we really love it when it's in person, but we've been meeting virtually and it's working fine. We have a different topic monthly. We met for a full day in the summer and that was kind of a building nuts and bolts. We introduced everyone to district staff. And then we have met monthly so far. We have had some guest speakers come in. We had Adam Dupre come and talk to the group about special education and 504 plans. We had an implicit bias workshop with Reggie Wingo from the Elizabeth Freeman Center. And today we had a really fabulous uh, workshop on data div driven instruction with Ben Klumpus and uh, his workshop it was really fantastic. I'm kind of fresh off of it. So I'm a little bit on a high of it. He had lots of hands-on practical skills that teachers can take with them to school tomorrow. Um, and he also focused on in-person kinds of strategies in addition to remote learning strategies. So that was great. We have a couple of different texts that we use. So we do some book studies. We are going to, some other things we're gonna be talking about this year are social emotional learning. The group is going to be reading Stamped, which is the uh, read for Mount Greylock. And there are different opportunities through the year for reflection and problem solving and planning. So it's, a, it's really, really nice, particularly this year, to have such a variety of teachers who are new to us. 
They range from special education to music and everywhere in between. And we have a really good mix of people from all three schools. It doesn't always happen that way. Often we have more teachers at one school than the other. So it's really great to be able to bring people together. Um, so I wanted to let you know about that. Another thing that we're working on in the curriculum office are the Student Opportunity Act plans. And that plan is due in mid-January. You may recall that we talked about this last year and there was an extension on plan filing. And we're actually due a little bit more money. We're waiting for the final confirmation, but it's a little more than we had originally planned, which is exciting because we've decided to focus our um, grant on research-based early literacy programs in pre-K and early, early elementary grades. Our goal is going to be to increase proficiency in reading across our early elementary students, hoping that we catch as many students as possible for, before grade three and beyond. We are going to use our funds to do things such as align curriculum between Lanesboro Elementary and Williamstown Elementary Specifically, we will be purchasing Foundations Materials, which is a reading program that we've been using in Williamstown for a couple of years and expanding and Lanesboro has started using founda Foundations and so we need to do some catch up with the purchases there and some training. I have been doing a lot of research on other kinds of programs. I'm looking at the Hegarty program, which is a phonemic awareness program that many elementary schools across the state are using. And it's been great because I've been, I think I mentioned this in a past meeting, I'm participating in state networking curriculum meetings. And this uh, early literacy is a really huge topic across the state. And so I'm learning a lot from what other um, districts are succeeding with. So we're looking at the Hegarty pro program. Um, another goal of the grant will be to adopt a district-wide writing program for the elementary schools, which is something we've been missing for a while. And also to consider new core reading program. We currently use the Reading Street program, which was a purchase that was made a number of years ago and is becoming outdated and the research on it is not as great as it used to be. So a big piece of the SOA grant, even though this is not, we're talking around the $30,000 range, this is not lots and lots of money, but <laughs> we're gonna make the most of it. Um, we will build stipends for teachers into the grant so that we can create an, a literacy team to help make some of these decisions and review curriculum, which is very exciting. That is due in mid-January and I'll report back on that. A final thing I wanted to mention, and Ellie can piggyback on this if she wants to, but um, Ellie and I have launched a bi-monthly newsletter, which we call Teaching in Tech at Mount Greylock. And if you would like to subscribe, you can let us know, school committee members. But it is a newsletter that is um, a curation of resources on teaching and learning, both digitally and other. and we're trying to use it at, we know that teachers are really super busy. So we're trying to kind of keep our eyes on best practices, finding great podcasts, finding speakers, and then sharing them in digestible portions that we push out twice a month with staff at all three schools where sometimes we focus on themes. Um, I did one recently about holidays and how we can be inclusive of celebrations and at not at the expense of celebrating nothing, which sometimes we tend to do. Um, so we, we're really excited about that. We, I think we've done four or five of them maybe. Um, but we're gonna continue with that. And it's been a great collaboration and there's a lot of overlap between my work with curriculum and Ellie's work with technology. It's almost, um, it's almost the same in some ways. So we work together a lot, which is wonderful. I don't know if anyone has any questions for me. We're also continuing doing other, you know, I'm arranging professional development and those kinds of things as well. Christina, you're on mute, but I have a question. I saw Jose's hand go up first, but okay, no problem. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't see his hand go up. That's okay. No, Michelle. Michelle, go first by by all means. Oh, I just have I just have one quick question. Are you looking to replace Reading Street with another core program? 
or is that what the literacy team is for? It is absolutely open for discussion. Perhaps yes. Okay. Uh, you know, our our reading scores, looking at both benchmark data and MCAS data, have been pl pretty flat, honestly, and. Um, I think the main goal of our SOA grant will be to boost our tier one instruction and make sure that we're doing everything we can for, and I'm just a little bit of teacher speak here, which I know you totally understand, but for every, <laughs> for people who might not be educators on the committee, we want to increase the capacity of um, teachers presenting the material that they're teaching to all students, regardless of whether they get any interventions or they have any special needs. And the, the focus on that is knowing that if we can do everything we can for all students, then perhaps our interventions will need to be fewer and we will increase students' proficiency in reading. Rising tide, yes. yes. Thank you. Yep. And Jose. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Christina. <laughs> Um, Joelle and Ellie, thanks so much for, for being here. And, and, I, and I'll preface this, um, sincerely thanking you both for all of the tremendous work that you've been doing in the district. Um, this question um, reflects things that we've heard at the earlier part of this, this, this meeting that we've had together, and as well as uh, feedback that I've gotten from both parents and teachers. There's a genuine concern about um, the effectiveness of the asynchronous portion of our remote learning hybrid model that we're sort of working under. Um, you know, Jake, who is a, also a, 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 an Atlantic reader, might have seen this, this article as well. But there's, there's some, some data out there that suggests that our K through two, K through three, you know, early learners could be 22 months behind where they should be. You know, so it's not that the pandemic has stalled their learning, they may have even regressed. Um, do we have any data to suggest how we're doing as a district? Um, in our elementary schools and, and, and um, where our students are? That's a great question. And I know it's something everyone's worried about. I'm not prepared to go in depth into this, but I will tell you that, yes, we do have some data. Um, I, I, I've been meeting with the elementary principals about curriculum. And one of the things that we've done is to look at the benchmark data. We use a couple. And, and again, these are like dipsticks of you know, they're just temperature checks to see how children are doing. We use Track My Progress, which we do three times a year, and it is looking at a variety of um, skills in reading and language arts, and it also looks at math and a variety of concepts in math. And then we also use the Dibbles Next, which is a um, benchmarking tool for reading fluency, which research shows that reading fluency concerns can be a red flag for other kinds of reading comprehension and other um, reading deficits. So we do both of those three times a year. And for children, and then we meet um, principals and specialists within the building, meet with the teachers and make determinations, do interventions. Um, and so based on what we've looked at, I was actually kind of surprised that I was expecting our benchmark data from the fall to be frankly abysmal. And I was expecting it to show real serious gaps. And looking at it both in terms of what a typical say first grade might look like in the fall, there's really not much of a difference that we're seeing from the spring, which was great. If you look at the same cohort of children, so we're looking at second grade this year, last year's first grade, and it's not across the board. So like, as, as I said, I'm not totally prepared to talk about this in depth. Um, at some grade, grade levels, it's more pronounced than others, but in general, it's the, the outlook is much, much better than we thought. And I can tell you that everyone that I've spoken with shares your concern that you've just brought up. I think we continue to have conversations about asynchronous learning and the balance between helping promote independence in children and um, at earlier ages, the reality is that's really tough. And when you have children, for instance, who can't read, which is what I'm talking about tonight, um, it's really difficult to know fully that you're making the best use of asynchronous time. And we're aware of that. 
we're very aware of that. And I don't think there's anyone who would argue about wanting, you know, wishing we were back in school. And, you know, though, Charlie, I, I, the teachers, the administrators share the same concerns as the students. So I think the short, the long way of saying this short thing is that, you know, it's not nearly as bad as we thought it would be. Um, and our, we're constantly looking. So, and teachers, teachers are deeply, deeply committed to doing everything they can to make sure that they're getting kids where they need to be and keeping kids where they need to be. I don't know if that really answers your question. Yeah, just, just to follow up, and it's a brief follow up. And, um, you know, are there plans in place um, as a district to assess? to do just that, you know, to, to, to dive deeper into the data and to really get a sense of, of how we're performing as a district and what, and whether, um, you know, how our students, whether our students are, are being set back or to assess how they're being set back as a response, as a, as a um, you know, as, as, a, as a consequence of, of the pandemic and, and, you know, the situation that we find ourselves in. Is there a plan in place? That's the short end of it. So try to get the words out. I think our plan is to continue to use the tools that we have and to do things like use this grant to be able to supplement what we're doing and to make sure that we're using the best possible tools that we can and to continue to provide professional development for teachers on the technological tools that we have available, which are many, so that in the situation like we're in right now where we don't really have a choice that we're doing the very best that we can. I don't think, I can guarantee you, Jose, that there's zero complacency, um, that everybody, everybody's minds and everybody's hearts are in the exact same place and we're working together and sharing those same concerns. Yes, and, and <laughs> that I know for sure. There is no, I, I, I have full faith in, in, in there being no complacency. Um, one last question on this topic and apologies uh, for taking up so much time, but the, uh, this question is related to that there have been some um, concerns raised by you know, both teachers and, and parents about um, this remote learning model that we find ourselves in. We're adopt we've adopted the hybrid sort of schedule where there's a synchronous half day component and, a, and then a, the, a second component that's asynchronous. Um, at the start of the school year, uh, when we eased into sort of a remote learning model, it was, it was a full day, pretty heavy day of, of screen time, but it was, it was a, the bulk of it was synchronous. Do you have a sense of, of, of whether the model that we're working under right now, this part-time synchronous, part-time asynchronous is as effective, less effective, more effective, than the model that we started with? I would absolutely defer to our superintendent to help me with this answer. Um, I will say that I've heard those same kinds of comments. And again, I will go back to what I said, you know, there's a balance between really fostering independence in oh, learners, yes. which will have great payoff as they get older. Um, as a mom, I can tell you that. and as a teacher as well. And then also that again, it's, a, it's an issue in the state and it's a discussion with the commissioner of education in terms of how much synchronous time there needs to be. I know there are discussions and this is where I will defer to Dr. McCandless um, with Magia about this. So I'm handing it over to you, sir. Yeah, uh, Jose, we'll get a little deeper into that in one of the presentations I'm going to do tonight if we can put a pin in that question for this moment. Thank you. <laughs> I, I eagerly await. I will say I recently was in a meeting with the deputy commissioner and this did come up and many superintendents are concerned about it and on both ends, is this enough synchronous time? Is this too much screen time and where is the balance and how is this impacting our learners? So this is not unique to our district. Yeah, thank you both. Thank you both. Now it's Ellie's turn. All right, so I got goosebumps when you're talking about the data because I remember when we were looking at it for the first time and I was, I was pleasantly surprised. Um, and I still have my ugly sweater on from student council, so forgive me. 
um, the teaching and tech newsletter, it's teaching and tech Tuesday. So it's actually like a triple T, um, has been a really nice way to collaborate. Like Joelle said, and what I love about it is that it's organic and we really are checking in and having a dipstick on what's going on within, um, our teachers and what they might need. So we might have a plan and we may scrap our plan because we'll say, oh, time out. They don't need that content this week. They really need this. So we're really trying to be responsive to the needs that our teachers are sharing with us. Um, I have a list of highlights that we've been working on with regard to tech hardware and tech software. Um, a big project moving forward is mobile device management um, within the district for our Apple products. Um, right now, we're manually updating our iPads and devices for special education students, and that's just really cumbersome. Um, so that's something we're working on. We are also inventorying, updating, and checking compliance with our Chromebooks. I sent out an email to the Mount Greylock students last week because we realized some of the Chromebooks were a little too far behind to receive the auto updates. Um, so we've had a really great response with students updating their Chromebooks manually and now receiving the auto updates that we've pushed out. So we've kind of shored up a few systems. Additionally, we are finalizing the single sign-on launchpad for the elementary schools through ClassLink. Teachers have been using it in the classroom as a soft rollout for the past couple of weeks because what we found was we, we thought we had it ready, but there may have been one or two small things we had to change. So I haven't pushed it out um, to families just yet, but that is coming. We are pushing out our mental health screener at the three schools. Um, so first parents will receive a form and it kind of looks a little funky because it comes straight from Pearson, which is the publisher for the mental health screener, but parents will be getting that at Mount Greylock and Lanesboro next week. Williamstown parents received that recently. Next, the teachers will fill out the screener. So there's a parent form, a teacher form, and finally we have a student form. Um, that students in grades five to 12 will fill out. That will be kind of our last phase. So we can look at the data and say, hey, where do we, what do we need? How much support do we need to provide? Um, are students struggling that we may not see on the outside who may not be self-referring to give us kind of another area, um, another data point, I guess, to look at. And we recognize that mental health supports are stretched thin or there might be cost hurdles for families. Um, so we are exploring options to provide teletherapy programming to support our students in addition to our school psychs and our guidance counselors. So next steps for that are to finalize our partnerships and review the referral and intake processes with our building-based administrative teams. Lastly, um, parents and students have been utilizing the help desks at all three schools. Um, the email address is help desk and then at the school domain, whether it's at MGRHS or at Williamstown Elementary or at Lanesboro School. And that system has worked really, really well. So if anybody is having a tech problem, they email the help desk and it funnels to either myself, Cody, who is our AV specialist at the high school, Rob Winook, our director of operations, Julianne Haskins, who is our tech teacher, media specialist at Lanesboro, and Rebecca Leonard, who's our tech inclusion teacher at Williamstown Elementary. They have been phenomenally supportive and they've been doing so much behind the scenes work that makes each day function smoothly. So our team really has a nice channel and I don't know, filtering system. So that way the appropriate person is resolving the appropriate problem. Um, so I realized that was a lot, but those were some highlights of things we've been working on. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Jose? Thank you, Ellie, so much as, as always. And I, I really mean it. I, I genuinely, and I think uh, as a parent, um, and I think I can speak for many parents, really appreciate all the work that's going on behind the scenes. Um, this question uh, is related to some concerns that we heard, you know, that Charlie brought up today, where our teachers, some, many of our teachers are struggling with with a broadband connection. Um, what plan do we have in place as a district, if we have one, to, to help support our teachers who may be struggling with, with, with broadband speed and, and, and connection? So in the spring, um, we inventoried our teachers if regarding hardware, um, internet, 
as well as software. And we provided hotspots to those teach or whatever they needed, whether it was hotspots or hardware or connections um, and set everybody up. So if teachers are having a tough time, they have reached out to me and we have set them up if needed. Um, if there are new concerns that have come up, then we are addressing those with the individual teacher. I don't wanna call anybody out. I think that some education regarding what can overwhelm bandwidth speed um, for both teachers and students is really important. Um, what I have found in talking with students is they don't realize that if they have too many processes working on their computer or if they're far from their router um, or maybe if three people in their household are Zooming that it might bog down speeds. Um, and so we've been doing some really great one-on-one -on -one troubleshooting. Um, Sally is always my pretend student. So I might talk with Sally and say, hey, where's your router? Where are you sitting? Let me look at your Wi-Fi. Um, and then I look at her Wi-Fi and her speed's really low, but then she'll move closer to her router. And then all of a sudden she's got the best Wi-Fi going. Um, so really troubleshooting with regard to teachers and students um, because everybody's situation is very unique and different. So we're coming up with solutions individually. How do we sign up for the teaching and tech newsletter? If I, I don't know, go ahead, Joelle. I was going to say we can add the school committee members on. And if you want to unsubscribe, we will not be offended and you may do so on your own. How about that? That's great. We do look though. So we'll be a little bit sad. <laughs> well, I was, I was worried about open meeting rules and violating that. So that's why I waited for a moment. Michelle, do you have a question? I do, yep. Um, I wonder if um, we know, based on the last school day, um, how many uh, parents, or not parents, kids or teachers had tech issues related to the snow day. Do we know that number? Um, I don't necessarily have a number. We had a couple troubleshooting issues, but nothing that was super drastic. Um, so, I would say it was not an atypical day for help desk and tech staff. Okay, thank you. Okay, any further questions for Ellie? Okay, hearing none, we will move on to the next agenda item, which are superintendent updates from Jake McCandless. Thank you. I am obviously looking at a at a different agenda because I have the principal updates first. Am, am I? You know what? I totally messed <laughs> up massively. Well, How did it, no one call call me on that earlier? I'm so embarrassed. That was supposed to happen after the athletic director updates. In the context of of messing up, you know, as we're discussing the. Thursday, learn from home day rather than a snow day. I certainly will forgive you. If you, will. <laughs> if you, you. did indeed mess up. <laughs> I totally messed up. Okay, <laughs> principal updates. And we have Lanesboro Elementary School first. So that is Nolan Pratt. Well, good evening, everyone. Curtis, it is your birthday. So happy birthday. I'll make this as brief as possible to celebrate. Uh, one, parent-teacher conferences ended on December 2nd. We had the first half before our last meeting. Second half was December 2nd. We had a great turnout, only missing a few families. Um, we also, report cards are going out soon. They were wrapping up today, and they should be in mailboxes, hopefully over the break. Uh, due to the late start of the school year, and since we're trimesters, it's a rather late time to get report cards. It almost feels like the end of a semester. Um, so. The end of the trimester was the 11th. The end of the second trimester is March 18th. And then the end of the school year is the end of the third trimester. Uh, we still are doing Wyverns of the Week this week. On our Instagram tomorrow, you will see three new Wyverns of the Week. I think since we've started, we probably have had about 24 or 25 Wyverns of the Week and one faculty Wyvern of the Week. Miss Ashley got Wyvern of the Week for doing everything she does in the main office. Uh, we had the first meeting of a committee yet to be named. This committee looks at the culture and climate of the school, uh, make sure that everyone feels like they belong. 
um, you look at the literature the, of the readings and make sure we're doing right by all students in the building. Last Friday, we did Loco for Coco, which was this awesome event put on by the PTO. Um, mugs were given out to anyone that purchased mugs and everyone, um, all the students got a gift. There's a lot of teachers and um, PTO members dressed up in costumes. I believe I saw Buddy the Elf there. I'm not quite sure if anyone else saw him or not. Um, so that was there. Let's see what else is on this list. Uh, I was gonna talk about the Universal Screener. It's coming out next week, but Ellie already did a great job of talking about that. And to be short, I will not duplicate. And lastly, tomorrow night at six, we are doing, or six or 6.30, we are doing the Winter Jam, which is, Everyone gets cozy in their jammies and hot cocoa. We'll have a couple of readings of books to kick the break off on the right foot. All right, any questions? Can I just say I love the Buddy the Elf pictures? They were awesome. <laughs> that was so great. They were pretty cool. Jose, did you have a question? I, 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 reg I regret missing out on, on Loco for Coco, but but the question I want to have is I'm curious about the committee, the, the committee that's yet to be named that is, is uh, you know, looking at the, the, you know, the belonging, the feeling, sense, experience of belonging. What's, what's that? What's going on with that committee? Can you, can you tell us more so about our, So this is a, I, I, I want to call it grassroots, ground up committee. I reached out to local community members, staff members, teachers, um, and what we're doing is we are looking at the curriculum that we implement. We're also looking at like everything within the school to make sure that every single student, when they show up at Lanesboro Elementary, feels like they belong. Um, last meeting, we honestly just like we've had one meeting so far. We introduced ourselves to each other. We talked about why it's pa like why we're passionate about this work, and then we talked about our next steps. Like so, we we don't have a name yet. We don't. We don't we're going to create a vision statement at our next meeting. And this is something just to help keep the school in check as you know i would like to keep it on for as long like forever just to always make sure that as the world progresses we progress with it so i it's a very vague description of what it is and that's because that's exactly what it is right now carrie yeah i'm just wondering following up on that is it connected to a school improvement plan goal do you have a di goal that you do this have might... one yes it absolutely is connected to a school improvement goal. Mm -hmm. Julia? Um, I love this topic uh, and I appreciate Jose for bringing it in and Carrie for um, connecting it to the school improvement plan. Um, and maybe this is a question for Nolan or maybe it's a question for Joelle or Jake. I'm not, I'm not sure where. Um, I just, uh, I guess the question is, is there a way to measure growth um, for belonging, and is that something that uh, I mean? I know there are in the middle high school. I don't know in the elementary school, because um, uh, there are so many wonderful activities to engage with, and um, sometimes it's also really important to understand which are having the greatest impact. So, how is how does that get measured? Julia, uh, with with Nolan and Joelle's permission, I'll jump in on this one. Um, we we have applied to work with um, uh, Deep who is a, you know, as you know, um, disruptive education uh, for equity. I'm struggling with the rest of that, but you know what I'm, you know what and who I'm talking about. Um, one, one of the things that we presented to them in our, our application was the desire to really develop or, or have them help us develop uh, so, some really solid measurements that we can continue to use. Uh, I, you know, from work in, in another district, uh, family surveys around belonging and student surveys, even at the elementary level, are, are, are good ways to collect, you know, do, do you feel like this is your home? Uh, so, so we have, we had sort of a laundry list for our, our prospective partners at DEEP for developing a, a, a short range, a medium range and long range goals, but they're all really incumbent on, they have to be measurable so we know we're making progress and doing the right thing. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Carrie? I have a general question. Um, what is a good way for those of us who are not parents at a particular school to stay in touch with the life of the school? Are there newsletters that go out from each of the schools or, you know, in addition to this tech and uh, teach and technology newsletter, are there, I mean, what would you suggest um, as a principal or as, as other administrators? So I send out a weekly update to all families. I'm sure we can find a way to get that distributed to the school committee. Um, and also we have an Instagram and a PTO Facebook page. I do not run either of those things. Similar things for us, Carrie. We have um, the, the, the website is, is updated in the news and notes. There's also a weekly push that is emailed out and the our Instagram and Twitter, right? Um, social media program that I can't think of right now is, is updated frequently by, by Liza and Colin. And at West, we do a Friday update. Um, we send an update to both staff and families um, at West. And we also have an Instagram um, that Ms. Cindy Sheehy runs. Great, thank you. I, I just wonder if it makes, I don't know if all the school community members feel this way, but it just seems like it would be nice to get the information from the schools as the parents are getting it so that we can kind of stay on top of, of what's going on at each of the schools now that we're all together. I second that. So put us on all the lists. <laughs> Send us all the hashtags that we need to connect to, right? Okay, any more questions for Nolan before I turn it over to Williamstown Elementary School and Kristen Thompson? Okay, it's all you, Kristen. Good evening, we made it. <laughs> um, that was a general feeling that in the building today was, you know what, we made it, we did this. Um, we can do hard things and we're gonna continue to move forward um, as the school year progresses. Um, some updates from me, um, something really exciting is that we had a school council meeting and um, we had some really great conversations surrounding our school improvement plan, um, which is being finalized. The draft is up. I have to add one little thing and um, we'll get that posted and, and I can also send it to you as well if you'd like to see it. Um, some really, really good conversations surrounding the school improvement plan. Um, we have effectively transitioned um, our students to, from hybrid to remote, um, both our teachers, our staff, and the kids have done this pretty seamlessly. Um, we've had some bumps in the road, but it's nothing that we haven't been able to problem solve and, and find resolutions for um, pretty quickly. Um, a lot of teamwork going into that. Um, you know, it takes a village and, and we're really seeing, we're seeing that um, in our building. Um, a, a big shout out to our Williamstown Youth Center who has been our right hand, our I don't know, our wingman, they have been absolutely critical and crucial in um, getting our students um, some support during these remote times. Um, we've been working with them. Teachers have been able to go over there and, and talk to students who are there. Um, lots of communication surrounding that. Um, so it's been really great and we're super grateful to have the Youth Center with us. Um, we have, in this process of going um, to the transition to remote, we have had three materials uh, distribution dates, which have all um, gone pretty well. Um, we've had all the materials down in the gym and we've had parents pull through the bus lane and we've, you know, we've getting really good at that. I think some of us might have a future career in, you know, running food and to go orders um, to people in the future because we've gotten that good at it. <laughs> um, 
So that's been going really well. And, you know, students who have not been able to make it to that distribution, we've been able to get the materials one way or another, um, whether it's driving it to their houses and dropping it off or them coming at a different time to pick it up. Um, so a lot of dedication um, goes into that distribution and getting the kiddos what they need. Another really exciting um, member of our staff that we have added is we are super, super excited and beyond grateful um, that we have Jill Pompey on staff as our reading specialist. Um, and um, if I have learned very quickly that Jill is the guru of reading and um, we are incredibly lucky um, as a school, as a district to have her on our staff. Um, she's been in the building a couple of times already. Um, she's already hit the ground running working with um, our, our, our team and our teachers and the admin um, ready to, you know, ready to start uh, on January 4th and, and get our kiddos, you know, some more support. Um, something that we pushed out today um, that Cindy actually came up with and that was a really, really great idea was we create a very, it's a very simple, um, but it's an online, ugh, excuse me, collaboration tool um, that we have created for teachers. Um, it's it's kind of just one of those documents to really get a dipstick to get a feel of, you know, what's working well, what are your challenges? And if you have any, what are your creative solutions um, to those challenges? And it, it offers our teachers as we're getting this end of, um, I almost said semester, but end of trimester reflection and um, a way to just really simply interact and collaborate on a simple form, um, and see what's working for other people and try to problem solve. And also it gives Cindy and I some tangible feedback on how we can continue to support teachers and get their feedback as well. Um, past that, I know people are really excited for the break. I, we, Cindy and I went around the building today in our elf pajamas and we tried to deliver some cheer and wish everybody a great break and um, you know, uh, ordered them to relax and rest. <laughs> so um, things are going great. Thank you. Any questions for Kristen? Jose? Kristen, thank you. And, and, and Cindy, for all, all that you do. Uh, this, there are two parts of this question, very brief. Um, is, is, is Wes or your, you know, your team, uh, in contact at all with with the team that Nolan has at Lanesboro, and and the second part of this question is um, how do we hear about how the remote academy, um, what the experience of the remote academy is? And that that's probably a question to to Jake. If there's a representative to, the, or maybe Jake will speak speak to the remote academy in just a few minutes. So the first Absolutely. part, I guess, is to you, and the second part is to Jake. Apologies, Kristen. No, no, no worries. Um, absolutely. In fact, Nolan, Cindy, and I have been working um, so much in tandem that we have daily phone calls multiple times a day. Um, we are on the phone problem solving um, and working together. Um, we've been att attending, I've kind of dubbed it the elementary curriculum team. Um, Joelle and Ellie, if you guys didn't know that, that's the new name of the team we have. Um, because I didn't know how else to deem it, but um, we've been working and looking at things to really um, streamline our processes and really have across the board, you know, the same things like report cards and curriculums and how do we how do we make sure that our students are um, prepared because you know eventually they do meet up at MG and we want to make sure that everyone in both schools have the same same opportunity. So it's been really great working with Nolan and Cindy, like I said, on a daily basis, sometimes an hourly basis. Um, and, um, yeah, we've we've really been able to work together and it seems to be going really well. Yeah, and Jose, I will pick up the second part of that question. And I will touch on that lightly in the one of the, the brief presentations that I will do. Um, you know, the remote academy is an interesting creature uh, that exists in some ways almost as a third school. And as we hit the end of the, or a third elementary school, as we hit the end of the first trimester, uh, we're, we're seeing some things that uh, we, we were not necessarily expecting because, you know, we're a new region and uh, a newish region. And uh, so there's, there's, 
there's some challenges that we're working through related to the remote academy. Uh, it still is a, a very good option for families who just their level of concern for a variety of reasons is is great enough that that they essentially are doing homeschooling with a with a heavy school presence. Uh, at the end of the first trimester here will be a really good opportunity for us to look at how are the kids doing, how is this working, and how can we improve. Uh, Nolan and Kristen were good enough to invite me to a faculty meeting that they had uh, earlier this week with the, or last week, late last week, with the Remote Academy staff. And I have met with probably five uh, families who have children there to get their feedback about how this is going. Uh, so that, that remains a work in progress um, as, as to how it's going overall and how it's going for individual students within the academy. And then Jake, as a brief follow-up to that, sorry, Michelle, just to, um, who, who is our, our point person, our point of contact <laughs> administrator for the Remote Academy? That's a, what a fantastic question, because in January, I'm going to be bringing you a proposal to name a principal of the Remote Academy, uh, and it will, it will be somebody that's already on staff, so it will be an additional job duty, but I think that's one of the one of the real challenges that our clients are experiencing is, you know, the teachers are from, from two different schools. Um, I'm new here. Fortunately, parents have felt free to reach out to me. I've had some really substantive, helpful conversations, but we need somebody who is the lone point of contact and troubleshooting for the remote academy. And we'll be bringing that forward in January, I would say. Michelle? But at this time, if you want to, if you want to get a hold, you can get a hold of me, Nolan, or Cindy, or Jake, and we will. If one of us can't answer it, we'll we'll figure Absolutely. out who can. Um, I'm sorry if I missed this, Jake. How many kids do we have in our remote academy? I am going to have to ask the prince. I did not have that number on the top of my head, Michelle. Ish. It doesn't need to be exact. I am thinking. Nolan, can you help me out with this, at least on the elementary end? So there are about 20 students from Lanesboro Elementary that attend the Remote Academy. Um, and that's after, so some families transitioned in and some families transitioned yeah. out, out of, um, as of December 24th. And I believe there's about 66 or 67 total in the Remote Academy. I can pull up the sheet in just a second. That was Michelle. My thinking was that it was right around 60. Okay, that, that's between close between enough. The you two, yeah, between the two schools. Now. Yep. So my question is a little bit similar to what Jose was talking about earlier, which is how are we monitoring their progress? Is it the same as we're doing with the, I guess that's a two-part question. Are we monitoring progress um, for, for students I assume, I guess I'm assuming we are um, now. And then how are we doing that with our remote students? I'm, I'm just concerned. I don't want our remote kids to get kind of lost in the shuffle. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I don't know if either of the principals or Joelle wants to talk about progress monitoring as it relates to the remote academy. Uh, but I, I do think that's one of the reasons why we need a one of the, what I would lay out is five or six pretty deep reasons why we need a single point of contact that oversees that. Like right now, we're struggling with uh, the challenge of Williamstown Elementary and Lanesboro Elementary have two different ways of reporting student progress out to their families. Um, it's a more traditional report card in uh, one school and a standards-based report card in another school. And trying to get those two, and you will understand this, Michelle, um, that's just not a matter of sitting down and doing a little crosswalk between one thing and another. It's, it's a deeper challenge. Then there's layers of, of technical issues related to power school where these grade reports actually sit for perpetuity uh, <laughs> that, that, that we have to work through as well. Um, I, I don't know if anybody that's on can talk about the progress monitoring for students. 
are we doing the same level of progress monitoring that Joelle described with our remote students as we do with our uh, hybrid students? So I, I can almost guarantee that they are doing track my progress um, across the board in all K through six grades. I believe they did get dibbles at the beginning of the year. I imagine that should be coming up as well. So they are being progress monitored and their data is being examined just as closely as students in the hybrid learning model. Thanks, and Joelle and Ellie are affirming that that is the case. So thanks, thanks all of you. Okay, that's great, thank you. And I'll say one last thing, Jake, that I think that um, parents being willing to contact you directly is really a direct reflection on how approachable you are. So that's a testament you. to you. Um, you. I really, that is one thing that I have really enjoyed this year thus far is um, I, I, the, the general shift in, in the approachability, I, I think of the whole, of, of the district as a whole. I think it's, we're moving in the right direction. Thank you. Okay, any other questions for Kristen? If not, we will move on to the Mount Greylock Regional School update from Jake Schutz. All right, good evening, everybody. So I have three points. The first is I'm excited to say that our student support center and our life skills programs are operating Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, which is, which is great for many of our families. It, right now it serves approximately 25 students and is supported by approximately 10 staff. So right now we have room for up to 60 students. Um, so along with the educational staff, I'd like to thank our support staff, the custodians, the kitchen staff that are working to keep our, those students safe and fed. So speaking about meals, just a reminder that all lunch meals are free for all of our students through the, the rest of the school year. You just need to uh, sign up when you do your health screener that you would like a lunch and you can pick it up at the elementary school closest to your house. Speaking about lunch, the um, students who uh, or families who may um, qualify for free or reduced lunch should go on our website and uh, apply for that free or reduced lunch, not because it will make a difference for this year because all, all lunches are free, but um, currently anyone eligible for that will receive uh, the next round of the PEBT card benef benefit card that will run uh, that should be out by the end of December. So uh, and the details will be mailed out to families tomorrow in my, my weekly email. But looking into the, for, uh, into the future, it's likely that this benefit will be extended. And so one of the ways to be considered eligible is uh, to be in that free or re reduced lunch. So if you're not sure if you qualify, I would recommend that you get on there and fill out the paperwork that goes to uh, Tammy Jennings, our uh, Director of Food Services and um, see if you qualify. So that was point one. Point two, I'm also excited to say that our student support team is now incorporating telehealth, specifically teletherapy into our tiered response to interventions. So this is in, this is in uh, addition to or augmenting what Ellie was talking about um, with, with uh, ga the gaggle services. So this is the ink is still wet and we've just started this. The service will be provided on a needs basis, uh, controlled by our student support team. The therapeutic services will focus um, uh, in scope and sequence to redirect students and families to a more sustainable programming and, and local resources. So albeit school-based, outside agency or private practice. So that was my second point. My third point is, um, and you'll see a common theme in, in my three points. And the third is um, our additional planning uh, to incorporate direct instruction for social emotional learning in semester two. So starting third quarter, beginning of semester two is progressing. This pilot program will focus on the middle school with continuing the second step curriculum, which is already implemented in the elementary schools. 
And in the meantime, we are researching with the support of Ellie and Joel, a uh, SEL curriculum to be used at the high school. And uh, so again, the, the future goal is of mine is to officially incorporate the, these, uh, a social emotional and learning program um, or element into the program of studies for the 21-22 school year. That is all I have pending your questions. Thank you, Jake. Any questions from the committee? Okay, seeing, oh, Julia. Sorry, I was slow. Um, <laughs> Uh, Jake, I'd be interested in hearing who would be implementing the social emotional, I assume that's for all students, who, how is that implemented in the schedule with which teachers? So you're talking about my third point, the, yes. the so this pilot program starting semester two is, um, it's likely going to be in either the seventh or the eighth, so it, it's hard right now, so right now, programmatically, we will likely pull either from an enrichment or a wellness period. Wellness, we often rotate students out like that is because every student takes wellness all the time. And so that's somewhere we can take students out for two weeks at a time and cycle them through um, a, a mini program. Uh, so that's likely well, the, they'll come from this, this coming semester, but the objective is to build it into the program of studies where there is a set time and a set curriculum uh, uh, instructor built into the schedule, albeit a, a an elective or an enrichment class. But it's uh, we're we're in the, the the beta phases of of planning that, and time will tell um, how how it goes this 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 semester with the second step curriculum. And I know we're already looking into some uh, different curriculum for the high school. So th there's there's a lot there's a lot to talk about, but I will, uh, I you know, I'll cut it off there so we don't get into the weeds. Yeah, I I appreciate that, and I just want to say I am thrilled to hear this. Um, so I'm I'm really glad to hear this progress. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, I agree with Julia, and since we all three of us were on school council together, that's not a big surprise to you, I'm sure. Um, I would love to see it get into the rotation. The only problem with the enrichment would be that not everyone takes enrichment, so all the kids in band and whatever that right. would. Be, but um, I I wanted to point out that just to be clear about the free and reduced lunch application, that that is a 100% confidential. It only goes to Tammy. Nobody else sees it, right? I just want to be clear about that. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Good. Completely that's confidential. It. Thank you. Any more questions for Jake before we move on to the next agenda item that I embarrassingly skipped over? I'm, I'm sorry, Christina. One other okay. caveat, just to jump onto that. Some other, many other schools have have programs or there's so many students on free or reduced lunch that nobody really needs to apply and everyone gets these PEBT cards, um, which is a great benefit. And we, a lot of our families could benefit from them. They just, they're just not used to, and there's a step they have to take to, to be eligible. So that's why I just want to, to make sure it'll, uh, if folks are listening to reach out and it doesn't hurt to, to apply. And uh, I'll, I'll also be emailing out tomorrow and it'll be on our website. All right, spiel over, sorry. Thank you, Jake. Next up on our agenda, another item that I accidentally skipped over is the acting director of People Services Update. So I turn it over to Patrick Priester and I apologize. Good evening, everyone. Um, so we'll give you some updates from the SPED department. Um, when the closure happened in the spring, our district was in the middle of a pro program quality assurance tier focused monitoring self-assessment. Um, all the data was actually due May 1st. That didn't happen with the closures. They extended it to um, this fall. So I, we're, we submitted our self-assessment in October 2020. Um, we have a TFM orientation with DESE uh, on February 8th. Uh, that includes uh, the superintendent and the principals and myself. Um, and then the TFM on-site review will begin in April 2021. Uh, there's another piece of the TFM. It's the Office of Language Acquisition. That includes our English language learner students, opt-out students, former English language learners, uh, English language learners with disabilities, 
and parents who need translation or interpreter services. So that self-assessment was submitted in this December. And I wanna thank Gail Sheckman for a great amount of help she gave in, in making that happen. Um, circuit breaker funds, again, have been, uh, they were submitted in June. Circuit breaker was, the funds have been, began to be dispersed this fall. Um, we also had opportunity to apply for, haven't heard back yet, but they've been submitted for 274 and 298 grants. Um, the 274 grant is a target SPED program improvement uh, grant support program. Um, and 298 is for, same thing, but for early childhood specifically, the three to five year olds in our pre-K program. Um, some good news, uh, our speech and language pathologist at Williamstown and Mount Greylock uh, did an in-house transfer to Lanesboro because we had an opening there. The speech and language there resigned this fall, moved on to um, Boston. Um, and so we ended up having to replace our speech and language pathologist in Williamstown, Mount Greylock, and it's Loretta Kittle. She came from Pittsfield, highly recommended, and she started um, last Monday, 12-14. So she's getting into our caseload now, and um, we'll be we'll uh, starting that process and updating soon. Um, our COVID-19 special education learning plans went out in late October, early November. It took a little while to get those uh, put together and implemented and mailed out, but we got those out. And we're looking at hosting a Parents' Right to Know Night um, this winter. A couple of districts reached out to me about coordinating with them so we can share the cost and get a good crowd out for that. And that will most likely be virtually, I can pretty much assure it. Um, but that's all I have for an update from the SPED department. If there's any other questions from the committee. Thank you, Patrick. Carrie? Um, I just have a question. Thanks, Patrick. I just had a question about Circuit Breaker. Um, can you just talk about that a little bit? So Circuit Breaker seems to be the one the budget element out of special education that that involves the school committee or the school committee hears about a little bit more. And since we have so many new members, I was wondering if you could just explain how Circuit Breaker works briefly. Yeah. Uh, for our more intensive uh, students who um, basically, if they cost more than $45,000 this past year, it's called a foundation. Anything over $45,000 we can apply for and get reimbursed up to 75% of that. So if we have a student's in the out of district placement, say um, at the old school I worked at, a Colburn school, it, we pay to send them there and we can uh, ask for reimbursement from Circuit Breaker for up to 75% of the money that we spent above the, the threshold, which this past year was $45,000. So it, it really only affects about 10 kids in the district, but it, it's money we can get back for, for the high needs and the services we provide. Any other questions for Patrick? Okay, I don't see any. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Happy holidays and happy new year. Thank you. Okay, next up on our agenda for real this time, our superintendent updates. So I turn it over to Jake McCandless. Thank you, Christina. I am going to uh, share my screen and um, I always find it helpful to have something to look at. Can you see that? Okay, I see head nod. So first I'm gonna speak tonight about the influenza vaccine requirement uh, due to uh, COVID-19. Um, just three slides on this one. Uh, and everything on this particular slide is from an August 19th Mass Department of Public Health press release. Um, the website for that is there. Uh, this is just really generally the four bullets that, uh, that, that, this, that the governor's order discussed around flu vaccine requirement. Students will be expected to have received a flu vaccine by December 31st, 2020 um, for the upcoming influenza season, unless a, either a medical or a religious exemption is provided. Uh, and there is guidance from the state around what constitutes uh, a, a valid request. And, and just for your information, essentially, if somebody lets us know that they are exempt, then that is the end of our process, essentially. Uh, it's not a fact, it doesn't trigger a fact-finding mission or questions 
to a family uh, if they put in writing that they are exempt for one of those two reasons, they are exempt. Uh, second bullet also exempted from this in general are K-12 students who are on a formal homeschool plan, so an approved by the district homeschool plan, or higher education students in the public uh, Commonwealth higher ed system who are completely off campus uh, and or engaged only in remote learning. The third bullet is that um, this new requirement is a temporary addition to pre-existing vaccine requirements for children attending uh, state-supported childcare, preschool, K-12, college, and universities. And then the, the fourth uh, bullet, which is an interesting one, is that elementary and secondary students in districts and schools that are using a remote model, whether that's a, a permanent model or a permanent, permanent for now model or, or a temporary jump into remote, ideally with a jump back uh, coming imminently, uh, those students too are required under these guidelines to have the, the influenza vaccine this year. And then the full link to all this information is also uh, at the bottom of the screen. Um, now today at about 3.20 in the afternoon, and this is following lots of conversation with Commissioner Riley, the commissioner of the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed, uh, he was he joined um, virtually our countywide superintendents meeting last Friday, and we actually spent a good bit of time talking about this upcoming requirement because we're really up against this. Uh, and so today at 3:20, we got this update: the Mass DPH, Mass Department of Health Immunization Division, had set the deadline of December 31, 2020, for students to receive a flu vaccine unless they had obtained a medical or religious exemption. And our school nurses have been processing, uh, not a tremendous number, but a number of both medical and religious exemptions. The deadline, however, and this is important for you to understand and we'll communicate this to our, to our uh, families, the deadline has been extended through February 28, 2021. So what was previously a December 31 deadline is not the deadline anymore. It's February 28 uh, in the upcoming year of 2021. However, schools and districts do have the authority to implement vaccination requirements at the local level and may set policies appropriate for their communities regarding the deadlines for submitting uh, documentation of a vaccination. So I'm not going to read the rest of this. You can read it. But uh, so the state has said the new deadline is February 28. Uh, you do have the authority to keep the current deadline or to choose a deadline that falls between January 1 and February 28. However, I will direct you to the third slide, which is actually a link at the bottom. This is actually taken directly from your policy manual, the Mount Greylock Regional School District policy that is available online through the Massachusetts Association of School Committees. Um, this is your policy around immunization of students. The note at the bottom in bold, uh, and I had this conversation with attorney Dupre, who suggested that um, the language that was added to this policy initially is the appropriate language and remains the appropriate language that we will comply with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts updated Massachusetts school immunization records, um, including the seasonal dose of the influenza vaccine. So this remains as a part of our policy manual until the governor rescinds his order requiring the, the vaccine. Uh, my suggestion to you this evening is, although it does seem you have the, the authority to set a new deadline that, that would overrule the mass DPH deadline of February 28, uh, neither I nor, nor the school's attorney are suggesting um, that we do that. So. It looks like Carrie has a question, Jake. Yes, Carrie. Um, 
So the obvious question is where do we stand with compliance? Like how, what's the, what percentage of our students have either submitted proof of vaccination or an exemption request? Yeah, I do not, I do not have, again, I, I am sorry for my lack of detail on a couple of questions. I do not have that exact number as we speak. We actually had some requests for exemptions come in today due to religious convictions. Uh, in, in general, the, the state sits at about, Berkshire County sits at, in, in the high 90s for the percentage of public school students that are actually vaccinated. Statewide, the flu vaccine is annually given to about 85% of the Commonwealth's children. Um, I, I would say at this point, I have seen or been a part of a conversation with our school nurses uh, of around 20 to 25 students who have requested exemptions. And then we, we have many students, I, I would venture to say more than half, for whom we already have paperwork documenting that they had their flu shot already this year. And then we have a sizable number of students uh, that, that had the shot, but there's somewhere the documentation of that is, has not gotten into our hands. So the school nurses um, remind their, uh, their, their clients and customers to please um, get those in. So, and Stacy just texted me that uh, just really over the last couple of days, we have been CC'd on eight to 10 um, exemptions. So I, I would venture to say that when all is said and done, uh, we are likely to be over 90% of our students having complied and families having complied with this order. Uh, and, and I have, have certainly been in conversation with the commissioner that um, while we, we do retain the right to exclude students, who have not gotten this shot uh, or gotten the vaccination and who have not requested and been granted an exemption. I think as we get closer to February 28, we wanna be very thoughtful about what it would mean to exclude students that have already had a disruptive uh, last spring and, and fall and winter for this year. So uh, to me, this, this this moving of the finish line out until the end of February is, is actually welcome news. Uh, you know, as somebody that would certainly advocate that our families do indeed vaccinate their children against the seasonal flu, as a parent that's done that every year for my three children since they were old enough to get the vaccination, uh, I, I think in the overall picture of wanting to serve every single member of our community to the best of our ability, this is actually a good thing. Are there are other questions about this piece before I move into the next piece and share my screen again. All right, uh, I'm gonna move into, uh, actually, I'm gonna stop sharing for just a minute and provide a brief update on uh, buildings and grounds. Um, first of all, I would just say as a new person in this community, it is awesome to see this campus snow covered. And it is particularly awesome to see uh, people of all ages using this campus for uh, cross country skiing. It's, it's really awesome. Um, it's very rare that I look at somebody and think, man, I wish that I had the ability to get up and do that. Um, and believe me, everybody's safe. I will not be out there with anything strapped to my feet. Uh, but, but really, what a, what a cool thing to see um, and what a, uh, what, what a lovely use of this campus by, the, by not only our own school community, but by the larger community. And um, it's, it's just a, an amazing thing to see folks outside doing this. So uh, well done to all those folks who use this and, and who uh, groom the pathway. And uh, we are the next, you know, what I, what I really was supposed to report to you here tonight is that we, we are in the process of taking down the bleachers and the press box uh, that have been essentially condemned 
and are, are utterly unsafe for use and unfixable. Um, that process will be ongoing until those are dismantled and taken away, the pieces of, which we're actually doing ourselves as a district uh, in order to save a little money. Uh, and I am certain that that will be done with as, as little disruption to um, the, the areas that the Nordic skiers use. Um, uh, so, so I know that, that uh, Tim Sears is, is already thinking that through and, and you know, uh, I don't know at what point it's going to be, uh, a, the snow will be less, but it's not gonna be completely a swamp and muddy out there because of the rain it looks like we're going to get at the end of this week, but, but the press box and the bleachers will be coming down and will be uh, moved uh, in pieces off campus and disposed of. So we just wanted you to be aware of that. And we do promise to, to be careful around uh, the, the, the spaces that the skiers use. Um, so moving, if there's no questions about that little piece, uh, moving into the, the last bit of uh, my report, I'm going to again share a, a tab and a presentation. Um, can everybody see that? Okay, thank you. I need to have more faith in, in the technology and in my ability to actually make it work. So I'm working on it. Uh, we, we did want to talk to you about the, the amended student learning time regulations. And so this is a this is a brief presentation um, to put all of this into a little bit of context. Uh, you know, first of all, for, for everybody that, that talks about the importance of in-person education, uh, you know, we totally get that as an administration, and I know that our school committee does too. Our current memorandum of understanding with our uh, colleagues who are, are, you know, union members, and who are part of the Massachusetts Teachers Association. Uh, there, there are certain pieces that, that you know, we think bear a second look and we're in that process. But, um, but, but overall, I, I can assure you, as we heard from the doctor during uh, public comment, uh, we're all at the end of the day, very dedicated to in-person education. Uh, it's, it's really the foundation, even in a historical context, as educators in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, Massachusetts was, was founded on, as is evidenced by this section of our Constitution, was founded on the necessity of a community to support education in its community. Um, the Boston Latin School is the oldest public school in America. Uh, the Cambridge Ringe and Latin School, Hopkins Academy, and Westford Academy are four of the oldest public schools in the country, among the top 10 oldest public schools in the entire nation. So um, we completely get the, the vitalness of in-person education 400 years ago, and uh, we really, really get the necessity for it now. Uh, you know, in-person education, it's clear to all of us that this is a superior means of providing education to the vast majority of students. Um, it's likewise clear that, that when we can't provide in-person instruction, there are some children in our community uh, that will experience little to no education. So the stakes are high for all of our students. For some of our students, we do understand the stakes are life alteringly high. And so we, we continue to keep in conversation and pushing the notion that there are some kids that have to be back. We have seen evidence of this uh, even in Jake's, you know, talking about having the student support center, having the life skills program. But we do get that it's good for all kids in general to be in school. The medical community, including the, the really worldwide experts from the Parabola Project, have been clear about the fact that there, there are dangers with having in-person school in the midst of a pandemic. However, there are also real, genuine, tangible dangers in not holding in-person education, uh, including really a sizable collection of, of potential negative outcomes for children and their families. 
And, you know, at the end of the day, uh, as a pragmatist, um, communities would not invest millions of dollars every year. Uh, finance committees in towns and in cities would not recommend spending millions of dollars a year uh, if, if in-person educational experiences were not vital to children. Um, online education is wonderful. It, it is a service to some families, but I think our history of investing um, hard earned, the, the hard earned dollars that our friends and neighbors in the communities we live in pay in property taxes to support in-person education suggests that, that um, in-person education is going to remain the model that we need because it's good for kids. Um, we, and we do continue to work through a legally voted by the Mount Greylock Regional School District School Committee uh, a legally voted and a legally binding memorandum of understanding, a memorandum of agreement to find safe, effective means of providing in-person instruction while also protecting uh, the health of our students, the health of our staff, and the health of our larger communities. So time on learning regulations in general, for those of you particularly that are, that are new to, to K-12 uh, policy work or, or new to the school committee, um, there are regulations ensconced in uh, mass general law ultimately, but particularly in education regulations that, that require a certain amount of learning annually uh, in order for schools to remain in good standing with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed. Very generally speaking, uh, elementary students need 900 structured hours annually in order to stay in good shape with uh, the state. So when we use the word structure or the phrase structured instructional hours, um, that doesn't include recess, it doesn't include lunch, at the middle and high school, it doesn't include schedule changes. It includes time of, uh, you know, instruction with a with a classroom teacher or a specialist teacher. The middle and high school level in Massachusetts requires 990 structured instructional hours for secondary level students, uh, and then you know we're all required to offer in normal times 180 school days, with the exception of our seniors. Who, who do not have the 180 day requirement because graduation tends to occur uh, before the actual end of the school year. And, um, and the seniors are, are in a position that, that when there are snow days, uh, the seniors don't have to make them up. And, it, and they are correct that it is, um, snow days are a gift that they have been looking forward to, some of them for 12 and a half years and, and certainly, do deserve. Uh, recently, um, there were some changes to CMR 27, 603 CMR 27 uh, in September that dealt specifically with our current time of pandemic. Uh, these included allowances for alternative learning models, hybrid and remote. Uh, and it also cut down the number of required days for student contact this year from 180 to 170, with the other up to 10 days being used to get teachers trained up and administrators trained up in the tools that they would need to use, um, whether for a full year or at some point over the year in order to facilitate uh, hybrid or remote instruction. And these, these uh, regulations are all available, of course, at the DESE website. Uh, recently, and we had a heads up about this about maybe two and a half weeks ago from Commissioner Riley, but uh, last week, the Massachusetts Board of Education, which meets monthly, passed a new uh, amendment to the uh, 603 CMR 27, which is the, the piece of public policy that, that, that governs student time on learning. Uh, and so this amendment, uh, amends the CMR on an emergency basis due to academic concerns, but primarily due to the mental wellness concerns of our students and the, the isolation and the sense of um, 
being set apart and alone that, that many of our students are expressing that they are feeling outside of, of you know, the normal school routine where it is as organic as anything that exists in the natural world that, that most young people want to be together with other young people. Uh, so the new uh, additions and amendments to the student learning time regulations focus on ensuring on a couple of things. One, that students have daily contact with their teacher or their teachers. Uh, and two, that they have daily contact with other students, even if that contact is in a very academic, uh, very controlled setting. The state really, uh, I think, correctly made, made the point that students need contact with the grownups that uh, care about them and care for them and help educate them, and they also need contact with each other. This amendment goes into effect on January 19th of 2021 and the advisory if you would like to look at it and I think Stacy included a, a, a lengthier summary in your packets uh, can be found on the DESE website. So uh, essentially here's how this impacts us. There are new standards and of course I, I would recommend to you or point out to you as we point out to ourselves and administrators and as we will be pointing out with our uh, teachers and folks as we begin working on this, these standards are minimums. They are not necessarily the gold standard. They are minimums that the state is requiring. So the, the new standards are the district and schools that are operated in a hybrid learning model uh, or a, 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 sorry, in a hybrid learning model, partially online and partially in person must provide students with at least 35 hours of live instruction over a two week uh, period, averaged across the grades, excluding pre-K and kindergarten. So what that phrase live instruction means is a combination of in-person and, and or remote synchronous instruction. So that means really face-to-face uh, -face or electronic face to electronic face instruction with a teacher. Students must have an opportunity to interact with educators each school day, including a required daily live check-in between students and educators. And again, that word live would be in an ideal world, live face-to-face, -face, maybe still six feet apart from each other and mask, but face-to-face uh, but -face nonetheless, or face to electronic face to electronic face. Um, a teacher having eyeballs on a student somehow. Districts and schools operating in a remote learning model must provide students with access to synchronous, meaning real-time instruction each school day, and they must provide students with at least 40 hours of synchronous instruction over that same two-week or 10-day school period. Uh, again, that's averaged across all grades, and it excludes pre-K and kindergarten, neither of which is actually a legal obligation for us to provide uh, or for families to take advantage of in the Commonwealth. Um, so how do these new standards play out here at the Mount Greylock Regional School District? On average, Lanesboro and Williamstown Elementary Schools uh, have, when we're in hybrid, uh, 31 hours of live synchronous instruction uh, between core and specialist classes over a two week span. So you will remember just from a slide ago, uh, what the state is looking for, particularly in remote, is, is 40 hours over a two week span. We're currently offering 31 hours of live synchronous instruction. On average in Mount Greylock Regional School, um, 43 hours of synchronous instruction are offered over that same two week span. The report that we got back from the state that accessed our data around what we're doing and how and in, and in what doses indicates that across all grades, we offer 37 average hours of synchronous instruction over a 10 day period. Uh, and that that is, um, and clearly the 40 hours is a plus or minus, that is an accepted, acceptable number of hours uh, even in our current remote setting. Um, and in addition to, to pre-K and K being excluded from, from this 
mathematical work. Uh, the remote academy is similarly excluded from this calculation. And um, that's really because, you know, parents going into the remote academy, families that have gone into the remote academy have knowingly made a choice uh, to not have their children subject to the disruptions of we're in hybrid, now we're in remote, now we're in hybrid, now we're in remote again. Um, the trade-off is that um, what, what is certainly or, or at least maybe lacking in experience in a purely remote academy um, is the trade-off for that is that there is a consistency there and those students will not be subject to stops and starts that the rest of our students are uh, are subject to clearly, and, and we've seen that actually play out. So our continued work ahead among the, the to-do list of ours, which is dozens of items long, um, we, we do want to, you know, to Jose's question from earlier in the evening, we continue to refine and clarify the expectations. Um, and these are student expectations, but also adult teacher and service provision expectations at the remote academy. Uh, the families I've spoken with have given some, some just really powerful feedback around their children's experience. Uh, the teachers have been very receptive to that feedback. And as I said, <clears throat> we are bringing forward a plan to actually identify a, a de facto principal for that work. So that work remains crucial to what we're doing because it serves, um, you know, four to five percent of our of our student body. Uh, we are also considering a move back to the first two weeks of school remote schedule. Those of you who experienced the first uh, couple of weeks as we were getting ready to go into hybrid, um, this was before I got here, so I use we loosely. Um, th there are certainly some teachers and certainly some families that have reached out both to you and to me that suggest that the schedule we were on for the first two weeks of school uh, actually serve their children better than trying to recreate the hybrid schedule in a completely online environment. Uh, and so if we, if we foresee that we are likely to remain in, in, in remote instruction for a sizable length of time, we think the trade-off of instituting yet another schedule change or, or a return to a previous schedule um, might be worth the disruption in order to better serve uh, children. We, as you heard from, from Jake and Ellie, we are providing and promoting resources for mental wellness uh, assistance to our families and their students based on uh, survey work, particularly the BESS uh, um, survey and family referrals. We are working to create more online opportunities for students and staff. And some of those opportunities are really not academic in nature. They are simply to have fun, to share, to check in with one another and to maintain relationships and maintain connections because that's good for everybody involved. Um, and we are continually revisiting our memorandum of understanding in our, in our own internal safety precautions to find pathways that make more sense um, in an educational environment where we've had nine months to learn about what COVID means and doesn't mean in a school setting. Uh, and as we look forward to having, you know, six or seven more months of school ahead of us. Uh, I think we need to have some serious conversations and will be about the value and necessity of our original Wednesday approach in the school district. Uh, Jose mentioned, you know, that, that we both are He's probably more so than me. I am an occasional Atlantic reader. Um, when I'm not reading um, state guidance around this or that, uh, I think the Atlantic maybe a month, a month and a half ago talked about the, uh, th this reality of, of hygiene theater, that perhaps the, the time committed to quote unquote deep cleaning of a building is uh, more about making us feel good and less about actually doing anything that's helpful to people that are in uh, public spaces. So that, that will be um, definitely something that we are discussing and, and will be discussing. 
uh, we're also looking at, at further considerations for how we can better and safer do lunch, uh, how we can offer the student support centers, how we can offer more in-person time with, you know, for all of our students on top of our students that really require it and need it most. Uh, and for, for all of our students, you know, and continuing adding more time to kids for whom education simply is not happening in any way, shape, or form uh, at home, absent the school's, uh, you know, place, space, and staff providing direct intervention. And, uh, and I can say that, uh, you know, the administration drives these conversations. Uh, feedback that we get from members of the community, our clients and the families that we serve have been incredibly helpful in helping to drive these conversations. And teachers themselves and paraprofessionals themselves uh, have been very helpful in, uh, in, in also continuing to drive these conversations. So just wanted to give you a, a, a brief overview of the new state regulations that are that are at play and then certainly take any questions. Michelle. So um, I, I'm not sure what the model was at the beginning of the year. I'm, I know what it was at the high school level because that's where my kids are, but I don't know how it was at the elementary school. Can you can you give us an idea what that looks like? Yeah, I think it was a little bit more uh, looking like the middle and high school, Michelle, where where it was um, more of a full day, and it was like you were doing class, but the, but the teacher was at school and the kids were at home. <laughs> uh, does that make sense? It, it yeah. was it was it was not the hybrid model with two cohorts. It was sort of a class together, even in an online setting. Yeah, so that's what we did. So I was just curious if it was the same as what yep. we did where I work. Um, and I will say, I, I, have you have have the elementary teachers um, have you elicited feedback from that population? We have. Okay, um, I'm, I I only say that because this is a, a, a sort of personal because I've been through the exact same thing, um, having a whole class online all day. Um, I I actually think is completely ill-advised. It's too much screen time for that, that age. Um, and I think that while that might, uh, that might suit the needs of, of some, I, I, I find that hard to believe. We've gotten really positive feedback on having to do only the hybrid schedule, having to do the half day. Um, because if a parent is also working, they can kind of schedule their meetings in the off time. Sure. Um, and then they can, you know, they can manage their schedule that way. So, um, you know, I think in general, I have some concerns about, you know, six-year-olds being online from 8.30 to three with, you know, half an hour for hour for lunch. Yeah, Michelle, the, you know, the, the, the teachers union has certainly done, a, I think, a really good job, um, a really solid job of soliciting feedback about all of this and more from their members. And then certainly, um, I get individual feedback, Joe gets individual feedback, the principals get individual feedback, which we discuss. Um, uh, Joelle was really helpful in attending one of the webinars around these amendments to, uh, to, to, the, to the student time on learning uh, regulations. And I, I think what, what you just said was a, is, is right on the money that uh, in terms of unintended consequences <laughs> and requiring a six-year-old to be in front of a screen for five and a half or six hours a day, there's multiple levels of concern from multiple parties around that. So um, I, I think you could look at this. I, I am really, uh, on one hand, very grateful that the state is this responsive to some of the concerns that have been expressed by the medical community here in the Northern Berkshires and across the state and across the country of really being concerned about the, the, the mental health and wellness, uh, particularly of, of early adolescents and just pre-adolescents and then adolescents that are, are, are transitioning into adulthood. Uh, I think hats off to the state for that this particular approach, um, I think, could be 
if you are of a mind, could be interpreted as, as one more effort for the state to, um, without much success of negotiating anything at the state level and with virtually almost 300 individual plans moving forward just among totally public K through 12s around how to handle education during a pandemic. This feels a little bit like a backdoor way of the Commonwealth to, to further box us in. Uh, so I, I think like most things that come our way from Malden, it, it has some very positive pieces. It has definitely some unintended consequences that, that we have expressed to the commissioner our concern about that. Uh, and and it, it has the potential that in spite of not necessarily providing the resources, the direction or the muscle to make it so, the state is boxing us into their vision of what we should be doing. Um, and I will shut up and stop editorializing with, with that, but happy to have any more questions. Thank you. Julia? I appreciate the editorializing. Um, so don't, <laughs> you don't need to stop necessarily. Um, so I don't have children at the middle high school, but I have seen the requests from people asking for that remote model. So I, I and I, you know, I appreciate actually hearing from Michelle about how it doesn't, how hard it is at the elementary school level. Um, but can you maybe share a couple points about how it's difficult, like what makes it difficult to move back to that? Um, is it, you know, is it, or te do teachers have to plan very differently? What, why? Why don't we move right back to that? Right back to the model that was used during the first two weeks of school. Yeah, I, I, I think certainly like almost everything we do in relation to um, changing schedules, changing teaching times, that there are certainly, you know, union implications, uh, you know, per in the context of our memorandum of agreement. But, but I also think it is, it is a different type of planning and, and it is a different type of, uh, uh, I, I think, you know, Michelle, if I can sort of borrow one of the points that you made, uh, I think there are some teachers and some families and some children even that really appreciate having much smaller groups in which to, to teach and learn. And, and that um, cutting the time in half, arguably, for some kids, but also cutting the cohort size in half is actually been a positive experience for some students. And I think a very positive experience for some, some teachers. Uh, it's, so, so I think that notion of, you know, our, our class sizes of both of our elementary schools are, would be envied in, in many school locations. And that's a good thing. That's a credit to the communities, to the schools and to the school committee and, and finance committees that support our budgets to make that so. But, but the notion of, of even uh, instructing 16 or 18 or 20 seven or eight year olds for five and a half or six hours a day, it, it is a different type of planning. Man managing that is a, is a different type of planning. Um, I, I would occasionally peek in on my son who was doing um, college university courses online. And I, I you know, that's a pretty motivated, pretty high level group of people that he was engaging with online. But there was also some people that were, <laughs> if I were the professor, I, I would have stopped and said, what are you doing? <laughs> um, so I think even the management plays a part in, in the challenge. Yeah, if, if I may, Julia, I might be able to add to that, that, you know, if you, there's a lot of, um, you're not muted, unmute, you're not muted and unmute. And when you do that with 18 children, I mean, the time it takes away from learning just to manage the online classroom with 18 kids in it is staggering. When you have a smaller cohort, you know, it's, it's much easier to manage. Um, and you can do big breakout rooms and, and things of that nature, but it's much harder to do breakout rooms with 18. It's just much harder to do everything. And on top of that, it's a scheduling issue. So you have kids who have speech and OT and PT and Title I services. And once you move from one schedule 
to the other, it blows that schedule out of the water. So all of that stuff needs to be rescheduled and that takes a lot of time. So that, that's all I will, will add to that. Just That's just from my personal experience with the exact same two models. Yeah, I, I think that's super instructive for me and hopefully instructive for those parents who are also wondering why remote, we aren't back in that same um, model from the start of the year. So thank you very much to both of you. Jose. Thanks, Jake. We're, we're gonna be potentially interrupted by a three-year-old who is uh, addicted to Zoom, speaking of screen time. Um, <laughs> The, uh, I guess the uh, several, I think, points of concern and may, maybe some questions to ask, um, you know, what, what I wanted to highlight is the, you know, being a, a household with elementary school age children is that, um, you know, the part-time synchronous, part-time asynchronous model doesn't necessarily mean there's less screen time because the asynchronous portion is still more screen time. Um, one of the concerns I have, I think, is whether we are in a position as a district to say something about what the costs of the pandemic are, you know, you know, in terms of uh, how well our kids are progressing, their education is progressing, their social emotional needs are, 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 are being, being um, fulfilled and met. Um, we heard a little bit earlier today about, you know, some attempts to address and assess where we are right now compared to where we were, but I don't get a sense that we're adequately evaluating um, what, what the costs are to, um, to the models that we're experimenting with. Um, then speaking to what you, what you highlighted, Jake, the, the, um, the recommendations, I guess, and you, and you described them as, this not, as not being gold standards, you know, the, the, they're almost minimum requirements of live instruction time of 35 to 40 hours a week, depending on context. You know, even when we were meeting in person, we weren't, um, you know, up to those standards, those minimum standards. And I don't think we're certainly at those standards now in, in remote instruction. And if we see that, um, you know, those lost hours of live instruction time accumulating for however many weeks, because we, we don't know when, when we can change course, my, my real worry is how that, um, what the, what the long-term consequences will be. So two-part question, long preamble, apologies. But the first part is, um, are we willing and are we planning on really assessing, you know, the, uh, the and I'm not sure if costs or situation or whatever it might be, you know, what our situation is, what, how our kids are, 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 um, are performing and developing and growing K through 12. That's the first part. What's our plan for assessing the real cost of this pandemic to our kids? And the second part, um, if we are accumulating lots of lost hours of live instruction time, do you think you know, a, a summer school model where students, particularly some of our, our students who, um, who, who are, aren't from families who can send their kids away to summer camps and, and, and pay for tutors. And I'm thinking about issues of equity that we, we really need to address. Do, do we as a district, sh or should we be thinking about a public summer school model where students can, can recuperate some of those lost hours of live instruction time to help prepare them for whatever a post pandemic year might be next year? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with the second question because it's it's easier to answer and I, I will have a better answer. Uh, I, I think, you know, whether it's um, local conversations among colleagues here or conversations with countywide educational leaders or state level or uh, even some, some college and university folks from the eastern part of the state I've spoken to about you know, what, what's really the big vision for how we fill the gaps that are being created day by day. Uh, you know, I, I do think that we, we are already thinking about what does the summer look like? Uh, and, and, and maybe even what does the 21-22 school year look like <laughs> in terms of extended school day for some, uh, potentially running um, some vacation programs for school breaks, uh, you know, and in terms of, so, so yes, we, we are absolutely thinking through how do we approach this knowing 
that there is some harm being done uh, and, and, and harm being done, you know, not, not by us necessarily, but by the situation and that the harm impacts some families, it, it impacts every family in different ways. <laughs> there's, there's, that's where I think like a summer school, extended school day, that's, those get difficult because I, I think some of the impacts on this are going to be really unique to individual kids. And we're gonna really need to think about how to personalize catch up, uh, whether it's on an academic level or, or a social and emotional level. Um, or, or trying to, to make up for actual regressions, not just a lack of, of moving forward or, or thriving. Um, the first piece is how do we, how, the first question you ask is, you know, how do we assess the costs? Uh, and we have a, a good deal of academic data from, from GPAs at the middle and high school to, uh, you know, formative assessments at the elementary school. I think the the harder the harder piece to really gauge is is what are the 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 mental wellness impacts. Uh, we we are rolling out the elementary schools have already started with a a screener for um, kids and families that are experiencing real trauma uh, as a result of this because of what's happening in a household, what's happening in your situation. Um, that's really our first layer of filter for who will have the first access to the therapy uh, that, that we're offering in a couple of different ways, one local option and one, one uh, larger, uh, more nationwide <clears throat> type of option, uh, option. But yeah, we, we need to really continue to do that because it's, it's, it's the, the costs on the other side. So say we were a community that we had just widespread agreement that we should have every kid in school every day taking as many safety precautions as we can, that the cost of not having school is just, we all agree the cost of not having in-person school is a much greater cost than the risk of potentially coming down with a virus that may or may not have deep impacts on, on adolescents, may or may not have deep physical and lasting impacts on young students. And, um, and we try to be as protective of the grownups as we could be. That's actually a much, that would actually be a much easier scenario to measure because we would have case counts and we could, and we could have people self-report on health outcomes. Uh, one of the insidious insidious pieces of this whole pandemic is that there there are damages being done that that we can see and that we can know and that pediatricians can see and pediatricians can know and there are damages being done that are just going to show up over time. So I, I don't have a great answer to your first question, Jose, except you know that that we are thinking about that and we'll continue to work on that. Just as a brief follow-up, Jake, uh, you know, as we near probably, uh, and, 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 and Joe can, can speak about the timing of this in terms of where we are, where we sit in the fiscal year, um, but soon we'll have to approach our, you know, our towns about, and, and, and find the respective finance committees about, about uh, the school budget needs. Um, are we as a district planning on scenarios this summer where you know, we may need resources to address, as you said, unique situations that students are facing due to the pandemic and the need to, to catch up, for instance, um, or, you know, are we planning a more general program, uh, summer school program, whatever that might be, are we in the process of, of thinking about that and, and determining what budget needs we may, we may need, um, or what, what type of budget we may need to, to, um, to, to, to meet those goals. Yeah, we, we are in the process of thinking about that. I would be lying if I said we can quantify it like right here, right now. Is this $10,000? Is it $150,000? Our, our um, sincere hope is, and I know Joe's been keeping a watchful eye on this, as have I, uh, and, and I do understand that hope is not a strategy, but we maintain the hope nonetheless, is that this would be 
to me, uh, and I think to us as an administrative team, this would be a really picture perfect way to spend additional federal assistance that comes our way related to the pandemic that, um, you know, in, 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 in special ed world, you would call these compensatory services. It's, uh, you know, that's sort of the, the special ed um, code word for there's something you should have done, but you didn't or weren't able to. And now you have to provide services that, that compensate for that lack of action. Uh, in this case, the lack of action, you know, maybe our fault, maybe not our fault, maybe just the way it is right now in the midst of a pandemic. But, but we would certainly see federal funds that will be coming to the district as, as really the first line of, of and, and this would be, uh, I think one of the wisest investments that we could make is, uh, is to treat this as a, as a fund for compensatory education. And, and that fund could take the form of uh, paying Williams students once they're back in action to help tutor some kids in very specific areas. It could be to run uh, small groups of, of tiered responses to, to uh, students who have similar learning gaps or who are missing um, uh, you know, similar foundational pieces to being able to move forward. Uh, it, it could take the form of just really a, a, a bunch of individualized programming that, that really addresses specific individual needs of kids. It, it could be a traditional summer school class for high school students that may need, they may need that extra, that extra month of physics or of calculus before they're ready to go onto a college campus in the fall of 21 and move forward. So uh, yes, we, we're in total agreement that we need to do this. No, we're not at a place where we could quantify the cost of that right now. Michelle? Just a quick question about um, the instruction. So I'm, I'm assuming, because that's what I'm doing, <laughs> or we're doing, um, that live in-person instruction in the hybrid model is generally your reading, your math, and writing, roughly. Is that right? Yes. And then the asynchronous work is your science and social studies and then a special. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So, I mean, realistically, what we're talking about is how much lost science and social studies instruction do we have and how do we make that up? I mean, because uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but at least where, where we are, um, most teachers are on track with approximately where they were last year. So I'm going to guess, since we're in exactly the same model, that that's probably pretty true here in our district. Is that accurate? I, I, I would say that's true in general. I, I think we we have to, you know, and we are doing getting ready to do winter benchmarks around literacy and numeracy uh, and mathematical literacy. So, you know, that that would certainly be, I think, the the first level of concern is making sure that any gaps that got built for our remote instruction students, our hybrid students uh, as well, um, that, that those foundational things got addressed. But then, you know, your point around the specific subject areas, uh, you, you know, I, I think one of the places I could go with your point is maybe it is sort of a fun science summer camp that gets a lot of, um, a lot of, of scientific principles and a lot of scientific knowledge out there for absorption by students in ways that really don't look or feel that much like school. Uh, and, and certainly that would be an option. And, and I think it's a, a space where we could work with uh, some community partners um, who, who might have really uh, be more adept at doing that than we would be. So there's some real opportunity there. Thank you. Thank you. Jose? No, I appreciate that that question, Michelle. And Jake, I, I loved I loved your your answer. And it and it, it gave me in well, an idea popped in the head that I'm I'm sure is is pretty pretty kooky. But I I I think what I heard is that there there could be existing 
programs out there that are that are focused on curriculum in some way that do it in a fun interesting way that doesn't feel like school those programs come at some cost could you see a needs based you know district support for students who who want to pursue those types of programs this summer could you see that as being a, a, a model forward you know where, where students and families with demonstrated need um, could use district support for their students to access these programs yeah, I always want to, when I answer money questions, I always keep my eye on the box that Joe resides in. And if I see his eyebrows go from here to here, I know I've misspoken. So I'm going to, I'm going to block Joe out. Uh, I, I would certainly see those as, um, I, I would see those as appropriate expenditures of, of dollars that come to the school district, Jose, particularly if it's a needs based. Um, I, I would also see opportunities like that as being um, really attractive to um, private funders that are out there or, or quasi-public funders that are out there. Uh, we, you know, in, in, a, in a former life did, did some work around a, a, a week-long science camp with some, with some much bigger social goals really at the heart of it. But, uh, you know, it was a partnership of, uh, of the Flying Deer Institute from uh, New Lebanon, New York. Uh, the not Flying Cloud from South County, who are wonderful too, but the Flying Deer Institute, uh, Jacob's Pillow, uh, Berkshire Community College, and uh, IS 183 of the Berkshires, the art school uh, that operates in South County, that, that really took on um, science and ecology through the lenses of dance and movement, through the lenses of being out in nature. Uh, with guided by an expert, um, you know, with the lens of artistic expression as a means of showing what you know about science and about nature, as opposed to taking a quiz or taking a test. So I, I do think that's an appropriate use of, of uh, educational dollars. And um, it's, it's, you know, with or without gaps that need filling due to the pandemic, it's certainly a vision that, that we should be examining anyway um, about how to provide really rich experiences that bring kids together um, in, 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 in different ways than, than school in general allows for most of the time. Any other? As usual, my brief superintendent's update has eaten a disproportionate amount of time. I apologize. I've been texting with our attorney that uh, not yet, not yet, we're not ready for executive session yet, but, uh, but thank you for your attention and for excellent questions uh, uh, and, and a page full of notes. So thank you. Thanks, Christina. Thank you. Okay, so. Next up on our agenda is the business administrator update, and that is Joe Bergeron. And I think I just gave you the ability to share. I've got it. Okay, great. All right. So uh, there were a bunch of great segues during that last piece into what I'd like to bring up, which is FY22 budget planning. Um, and I'm going to bring up the far less numerous slide <laughs> set so that you can you can follow along and, and take notes as you want. Um, so FY22, that's not this year, that's next year. Uh, as we wade through this year, the, the time does fly by and we're all trying to make sure we're prepared for what happens next. And one of the big questions is how do we harness this year's education so that we're better prepared for next year. You know, th this year we were really hit by a storm after budgets had already been approved and we were flying towards the year. Um, and, and next year will be different, but at the same time, there are a lot of variables that we're not accustomed to when we do enter budget planning for the next year. Um, the biggest one is what, what will the school year look like? Uh, Jake was alluding to a number of different efforts that this district has typically not had in place uh, that we might need to consider for this coming year. Um, how much will this year or next year look like this year in terms of hybrid planning, 
um, a remote academy, um, all of the other aspects that we've had to put in place this year that, that are really up in the air for next year. Um, and how do we manage the, the, the fatigue, but also the, the knowledge that we've built up this year as we try to be, be our better selves next year? Um, that school year planning is underway. A lot of it is very much magic eight ball stage right now, um, which is not very comforting from a budget perspective. And so I think we need to very quickly get to the point where we're, we're more in the driver's seat there. Um, local, state, and federal budgets have never been this up in the air in my lifetime. Um, in terms of local budgets, I think it's, it'll be early this in January that we start to get a sense of where the towns are in terms of their financial outlooks. Uh, the state budget, we, we just got the FY21 approved budget. Um, FY22 will hopefully be a little bit a, ahead of that one. Um, the governor is still optimistic that, that uh, we'll start to get a better sense as we move through January of, of what to look ahead um, for, for FY22. But I, I think it's challenging to have any real sense of where that three, four million dollars from the state will really head as we go into FY22 at this point. And then the federal budget. Um, this year, CARES Act funding um, did a lot to support the efforts that we needed to undertake, um, but it did not do nearly enough to give us the opportunity to really bolster what we were doing in a way that said, this is well-funded and we can go after additional programming, additional staff in a way that was confident. Um, all of that really needed to be scrapped together locally. And so as we look at the federal budget, to what extent that will bolster our ability to be confident about moving bravely into next year as opposed to hesitantly. I think it, it, it'll play a bigger factor than it normally does, at least within our district, where federal grants and, and budgets um, typically don't play as large of a role as, as state funding and certainly not local funding, which is the bulk of our, um, our financial backing. Um, and then our contracts. I, I don't need to mention that we are entering the third and final year of our current union contracts. And so the year that we move through next year, um, about two thirds of our budget is really dictated by what happens with those contract negotiations. So um, having that up in the air a bit as well, um, creates some instability and question marks around how to budget as accurately as we possibly can for next year. Um, so with all of those gray areas swirling around, I will take you through some of the things that we that we know for sure, because sometimes that's the most comforting way to when you've got a bunch of pie in the sky targets that you're that you're trying to manage. Um, here are the steps that we know we will take, um, and I'm going to actually work from the bottom up here. Town meetings right now, June 8th and May 18th are two towns town meetings on the books for 2021. Um, they are where our FY22 budget will be voted. Um, March 4th is our public hearing. So that's where the school committee votes on a budget that it wants to take forward to those two town meetings. Um, ideally right after that, as well as to a lesser extent before it, we're able to give our town's finance committees a sense of where our budget is headed. Um, right after the public hearing is when we can give a formal lengthy presentation that that hopefully gains the support of the finance committees of the two towns. Um, and before that, sometime typically late January, sometime in February, we do start to give the town finance committees a little bit of a heads up as to where we think our budget is headed. Um, but that's all subject to the caveat that the school committee does not make its determination of what budget it wants to put forward until that March 4th public hearing. Um, and then I laid out all of our school committee meeting dates and the finance subcommittee dates between now and that public hearing. Um, so those are the meetings where we'll be able to lay the groundwork and look at the revisions of, of what we have moving along. Um, the other more detailed points um, in terms of touch points during budget development that I have at the bottom of the screen here um, requesting and receiving school council priorities in line with their school improvement plans. That's something that is, that is getting started now. 
Um, and we're certainly starting to hear a bit from the school councils, but I think we're gonna hear a whole lot more as we move through the next month, um, receiving inputs from both towns regarding their financial outlooks. That is something that uh, I think the two towns are really starting to gear up, trying to understand where their revenue is this year and what that means for next year. Um, the state's budget also plays a role there for them. And, and so we're gonna have to see how, how all of that is playing out. Um, we will have our health insurance rates set for FY22 in mid-January by Berkshire Health Group, BHG, which is the collaborative that we're a part of um, for health insurance. We will at some point receive our early FY22 cherry sheet estimates from the state um, and continue to get updates from them and bring those to the school committee as we receive them. Um, coordinating draft budget reviews with all the stakeholders. I, you know, the school committee is one, the special education PAC, school councils, the towns and the town's finance committees. Um, all, of, all of them, all of you are, are a part of that budget development process and trying to juggle that with all of these unknowns is something that we're we're both looking forward to and also pretty wary of at this point trying to make sure everybody does get their looks um, and has their input um, taken into account as it should be um, and then a couple of school committee decisions that will happen over the course of uh, late January and February um, setting the tuition rates for towns that tuition in uh, for FY22 and setting up our school choice slot openings for FY22, um, looking at how we wanna project out for school choice program use for FY22. So that was my very quick but dense tour of where we're headed for FY22. Um, I'll open it up for questions, um, knowing that it, that probably leaves more questions than, than I provided answers. Any questions for Joe? Jose? I'm, I'm getting tired of my voice. So I'll keep this super brief, Joe, super brief. So for, for those of us who, who are very new uh, to, to the school committee, what, what, is, what, is, um, what can you share with us about uh, what the process looks like in terms of conversations and, and you know, who's involved in those conversations. Ultimately, you know, what, what are all the steps involved up to the moment we meet on, uh, on the 4th in terms of identifying what we want the budget to look like? Sure. Um, we will, you're talking about from the school committee's perspective. That's right. Yeah, okay. Um, we will start to bring draft budget components forward to the finance subcommittee and then to the full school committee as we move through January and February. Um, the full school committee, I think every conversation that we're having from here forward, or I mean all, all year long really, <coughs> is, is helping to drive how Jake is factoring in that input. For instance, around summer programs, around programs that will happen next year, around um, the remote academy and what that looks like around um, how hybrid planning is working. Um, all of that is, is yeah, both explicitly as well as implicitly being factored into where the proposed budget goes for FY22. Um, each of the meetings in February will definitely be moments when um, segments of the budget will be, will have more spotlights on them. Um, and then typically the public hearing in early March is the moment where when changes to the district that are flowing through into the budget have and are coming to light, that's the moment where those final tugs and pushes in various directions typically happen. Um, so hopefully it's a, it's a very gradual buildup of, of, um, confidence in the budget, but at the same time, I think given, given what this year looks like, um, every one of those meeting dates that, that we put up there, um, is going to have some amount of discussion and, and necessary tension too. Thanks. 
Barry? Yeah, I would just add that there's there's one date, Joe, if you could add the date to your list of the 45 days out from the first town meeting. That's when we're actually required to vote the budget. So if we're not ready on May 4th to vote the budget at the public hearing, you know, maybe some things come up that we need to go back and talk about as a committee, we will be scheduling special meetings, my guess is, is to do that. So I don't remember what the date was that, that was 45 days out, but it's later than March 4th. Um, so there's a little bit of wiggle room there. And that's, again, Jose, if you go to the regional agreement, that's embedded in there. That, that I can definitely add that date into that document and, and circulate it. Great, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Joe before we move on to our next item? Okay, I think you're off the hook, Joe. <laughs> Okay, moving on to our next item. It is finance subcommittee update. So I'm gonna turn this over to the chair of the finance subcommittee, Carrie Green. Great, thanks, Christina. So uh, the finance subcommittee met um, uh, last week on December 17th for about an hour and a half. Um, I'd like to give an overall report if it's okay with the chair and then come back and discuss each item that's on the school committee agenda. So um, the draft minutes are in the school committee packet as item 12 and there are a number of related documents. Um, we reviewed the warrants and discuss the items that are listed on the school committee agenda. Um, all three are listed here as votes, but only the first one is coming to the school committee with a recommendation from the finance subcommittee. I'll add at this point that um, uh, Joe and I had a very brief conversation about item number one, the West Renewal Fund uh, usage. Uh, we had a brief conversation just prior to this meeting and we would like to postpone this vote. Uh, we're waiting on an updated um, proposal or invoice or um, you know, document from JAMROG um, that has a little bit more detail to it. So uh, technically that was going to come to the school committee as having already been um, proposed um, and voted on by the finance subcommittee and would not have needed a vote uh, or, or a motion rather um, just a discussion and a vote by the um, school committee, but we're gonna postpone that uh, to the January, one of the January meetings. Um, over the course of the discussion though, about the West Renewal Fund, we did look at the actual fund agreement and we talked about the funds available so I can share with you, as you would have seen in the finance um, subcommittee minutes, that there is um, about, let's see, a million six hundred thousand twenty five six hundred twenty five thousand nine hundred eighteen dollars in the renewal fund, in principle, and fifty one thousand one hundred eighty seven dollars in the spending account. We expect um, the Jamrog work. Uh, to come in within the spending account. So uh, right now it's it's like at around, it's a little over 20,000. So we'll be within that spending account dollar. Um, so we then discussed the proposal from Perkins Eastman um, and the feedback that Joe received from them. I'm gonna have Joe talk about that um, after I finish my overview. Uh, there is a vote attached to this item in case the school committee is ready to move forward. Um, the Perkins Eastman proposal is once again included in the packet, along with some historical documents that had been requested at various times since the last school committee meeting. These include the 2016 proposal from the October 2016 Finance Subcommittee to the then School Committee outlining the early thinking around the use of the gift, as well as the actual gift agreement and the press release from when the gift was accepted by the committee. 
Uh, there's also a listing of District 1 schools that have artificial turf, and this is a document that Christina requested. So we can go back and discuss any of these um, over the course of, of a discussion of that Perkins Eastman proposal. Um, we did not take a position on the Perkins Eastman proposal in the Finance Subcommittee. Members felt that it should be a full school committee discussion. We also did not take a position on the renewal fund allocation for the same reason. Um, there is an investment returns document that was produced by Joe in response to the question that came up at the last school committee meeting um, using the actual annual returns over the past two decades. Joe uh, demonstrates in that document that $1 million set aside in the year 2000 would have yielded approximately 3.9 million. 1.25 million would have yielded approximately 4.9 million and 1.5 million over 20 years would have come to about 5.9 million. Again, this is had those dollars been set aside in 2000, what would it look like in 2020? We also talked about the big ticket items that would likely come due for repair or replacement um, after another 15 or 20 years. These would be the roof, the floors, and the window, windows, excuse me. Um, so that's a summary of the finance uh, subcommittee meeting um, that is supplementing the notes that Steve takes, which are they really make you feel like you're there. You don't have to actually watch the video because it's all there in the notes. It's incredible, the detail, but um, I'm not sure, uh, Christina, how you want to proceed. Do you want me to frame the Perkins Eastman discussion or maybe actually the best thing um, next would be to have Joe talk about um, the, dis the conversation he had with Perkins Eastman about the proposal itself. Um, as you know, there were some questions that were raised in the finance subcommittee uh, regarding um, the, uh, the process and the uh, proposal, what's different really about this one, um, and Joe can um, start us off with that. And then the, the lights went out. Yeah, perfect timing. Do you want me to? Yeah, so you, you all have seen the proposal. Uh, we had it in the packet um, probably a month ago. It's come to the finance subcommittee twice. Um, and we certainly um, can vote on it tonight. A vote would move, a vote in favor of the proposal would move the process forward. Um, the new school committee members are inheriting a vote from the previous school committee um, from October of 2020, which um, has brought us to this position of um, requesting a proposal from Perkins Eastman of uh, what, it, what would it take essentially to put together um, bid documents so that we could put a project out to bid if the school committee chose to do so. So that's where we're at is um, needing to vote on this proposal. The committee is bound to the process, but only to the point of the next vote. So if we vote tonight and the vote doesn't favor putting the proposal forward, then we need to regroup and decide what as a committee we want to do. If the committee votes in favor of the proposal, then we are moving forward um, with the synthetic turf, the ADA um, and Title IX compliance and the value engineering process. Um, I and, and the track as a ad alternate. Um, I'm on the record as having voted in favor of moving forward with this process in October. I'm also on the record, if you read through to the end of the uh, finance committee minutes as saying that I would actually like to see us be able to um, put in a turf field and a track and have a million dollars set aside to um, grow over the next decade or two as a renewal fund. 
So that's my position. I'm happy to talk more about that, but I think it would be better to hear from Joe about the proposal itself before we go into a discussion, a further discussion about the pros and cons. Sure. So the, the Perkins Eastman proposal was a um, very direct and targeted response to the request to figure out what they needed to do in order to get us through first the value engineering process where we would look at all of the options that had been laid out by Traverse following the, the last bid process, as well as dive a little bit deeper and figure out um, exactly how to, as a, as a district, as a school committee, weigh those options and make decisions on them. That would be part one. Part two would be to um, update the detailed design. Um, because it's over a year old at this point, there would be numerous engineering aspects as well as um, the design aspects as it relates to this building that did not exist and, and was a little bit different within the context of that um, design and proposal um, uh, than where we stand today. So um, they put forward a quote for $44,000 to walk us through that value engineering process as well as the redo of the detailed design and bid document process, um, knowing that that was an interior portion of the contract that we had executed with them in 2018 that is designed to take us from basic design through that middle step, which is detailed design and bid, all the way through construction administration. So this is asking for um, additional work within that middle portion of the overall process that a designer is involved in. Um, and so this is Perkins Eastman's proposal for that purpose. It's, it's let's be pragmatic, let's look at value engineering, let's um, try to figure out how to move forward within this um, bidding season in January, February, early March to try to move that along as the school committee had voted back in October. So that's what Perkins Eastman put before us and that stands here tonight. And in terms of the timing, um, we are looking at, um, you know, taking, what, what did you say, like six to eight weeks for this process um, before the documents actually hit the street. And then there's another month of um, where the bids come in. And so construction would potentially be over the summer uh, with the goal of having the um, work done prior to the start of the next school year. Um, we are in a, well, one of the reasons that we're on that timeline is so that we can meet the um, waiver, the, the, the deadline that we are on, as you know, for ADA compliance, um, we need to have the work completed prior to the next school year in order to meet that April, 2022 deadline. Uh, Julia. Julia, sorry, Christina, do you want to moderate you, the discussion? You can, you can moderate it, it's fine. It, okay. Julia, go ahead. Um, can I ask two questions about the proposal? Um, at first, <clears throat> it was helpful, Joe, for you to describe this is about the middle of that process, that middle chunk. Does that mean we already have, we already have a contract in place and an agreement for the latter part, the bidding and the managing the bid process and the um, construction management at the afterwards, at, if we if this were to move forward, is that right? I'm just trying to understand yes. what other costs would come down the pike. The portion of that contract, the original contract from 2018, mm -hmm. that still remains is the construction administration portion yeah. um, for the fields related work. So that's 
that's the portion that's still there under contract for happily. Um, yeah. Is that your question? Yeah. 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 So, and then the second question was in the minutes. Um, and yes, Steve, thank you. <laughs> These were wonderful minutes. Um, there was a, a, a piece of the conversation in the meeting about potentially bringing in a third party to help with planning that Joe seems to have described in the meeting. Um, and I'm just curious um, how long that would take, um, knowing that we're on a tight time frame if we were to move forward, but we wanted to take a step back and, and think about some of this. How, like what, what does that do to the timeline? So that would impact the timeline for, for sure. Um, the question would be if, if the district wanted to do some sort of long-term capital planning, let's, let's take a, a relook at things that were done in 2016, um, and try to evaluate all of the different options, whittle those down to a finite set, um, taking advantage of all the work that has been done, but, but build that case from the ground up. Um, that is something where we could go outside to a, um, to a third party that would be viewed as knowledgeable in all the things that you can do with a campus like ours, um, and help with the, the surveying of the community and the, the interactions with, um, with the school committee in terms of understanding options and, and what those might look like, what those might cost. Um, that is not something that Perkins Eastman itself would do. It's also not something that Traverse itself would do. Um, it is something that typically higher education institutions um, utilize far more often. Uh, given our 120 acre campus, this is, this is a space that is pretty sizable. It's a pretty big blank canvas at this point. Um, so that discussion within the meeting was more about um, how, how might we go about that? Would we do it with, with someone internally being asked to, to steward that? Would we utilize um, one of the third parties that Perkins Eastman could know and, and refer to us? Um, how, would, how would we be interested in going about that if that was the, the preference of the school committee? Okay, okay. Um, and, and do you have a sense of how long that kind of process takes? I think that all depends upon what yeah. what we want that process to be. Um, if it's if it's a lightweight one that's designed to be quick, uh, I think that probably what um, from what I know of it, we would probably want to take a look at all of the different options that exist. Yeah. Then get community feedback on those, and then whittle that down. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that I think realistically, you're looking at at least four, eight, 12 weeks. Okay. Okay. And, and um, I, the, the point is not lost on me that we can't, at, at least I, as I understand in these minutes, it would not make sense to try to, it might not make sense to separate the projects. Because if we go forward with just ADA and um, Title IX, while we are following a process to think strategically about what we really want, we may have to make decisions that then get undone and we duplicate or, or have to change work down the line. Is that, is that how I, did I read that correctly? Like we may end up doing double work on some of the construction. The short answer is, is yes and no. Oh. Um, <laughs> yes, if we wanted to so part of the discussion during the finance subcommittee meeting was, would it be possible to think about the campus as something where we get baseball, softball, and accessibility to the current John Allen field done, and then look to the other part of the campus and address that? Mm -hmm. Is that something that is feasible? Um, we have not talked to the design team around what their thoughts are on that, or um, experts around what that would mean for the desirability of a contractor bidding on a smaller project to start and then needing to 
bid again later on a on a lar on another project. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of the practicality of it, so yes, that's that's conceivable. Um, the the no is where we're not really sure to what extent that really does impact okay. um, overall costs and and what needs to be done and then redone. Okay. And I would just point out that that's always been an option. If, if, if you go back to the 2017 um, PowerPoint presentation from Jones Witsit, um, it was always presented as an option, but never voted on as, a, as a, something that folks wanted to move forward with. Yeah. So again, this committee can change course, um, but there, there are probably reasons why it was not put forward as let's just do ADA compliance and mm -hmm. um, Title IX. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I again, I, I think, um, do we wanna start over and envision what, what would be our list in 2020 as opposed to what was the list in 2016, which is, you know, a historic document or, Mm -hmm. you know, most of those things, I could walk you through what, what happened to every single item on that list, but that's not a good use of our time right now. Um, or do we um, have faith that, there, that the processes that the school committees put into motion over the course of the last four years were well thought out and well deliberated and well executed? Were they perfect? No. No process ever is. Um, were they, um, you know, were they public meetings that were all recorded and and available? Yes. Um, so we have documents for all of it, and um, you know, I I personally have faith in the process. I have faith that the all the school committees, some of which I were on. Um, did put the kind of time and energy and deliberation into, you know, getting us to where we are today. Um, so, to, to, you know, that's that's the question I think that you you're struggling with and that many people have raised. And if I can, I may just put a couple of points on that. Um, I. I actually, since even since the fora, a couple people reached out and walked me through even more of what has happened. And I do believe, I, I agree. I wish I, I could see a bigger picture, but I know that there are there were many conversations um, and open discussions around what what people wanted. Um, I personally still struggle um, to understand how it fits into a broader plan, um, and so like a strategic plan for athletics over time with declining enrollment, that that kind of thing. But I can get myself over that, I think. Um, but I, especially in thinking about, I'm I'm struggling, I guess, with two sides right now. One is, listen, you know, it is nine o'clock in this meeting. We've been on the phone for or on the Zoom for three hours, having important conversations and seeing the tremendous amount of work that the district needs to do around um, all the pandemic supports for kids now and in the future and the budgeting and, and the big questions that I think the school committee is gonna need to focus on and continuing a conversation about turf, <laughs> about which should we do or starting a new process feels like I, it could continue to take a lot of our time when the most, to me, some of the most important work that we need to be focused on is becoming very evident, um, and you know, I, I don't, I, I don't want us to spend so much time on on this issue that's been going on for so long. the The flip side is, is it's um, even if the best process has already has already happened, we do live in it. We we now know the world is very different in 2020 than it was in 2016, and so how do we take into account new information um, for this important decision? And so. I don't have answers to those questions. Um, I, that's, I'm just sharing what I'm struggling with and I'd be very interested to hear how other people think about those issues. Uh, this is Steve, I guess I can say a few words. I'll just type it up later. 
Um, I've been on three or four different committees that have been struggling with this issue. And I can say that we have listened to a lot of people. I guess to me, one of the biggest changes since 2016 is just how, highlighting just how important it is for us to be able to have our kids outside and engaged. And this is something that we can still do even in the COVID era. When the school year began, we started remote but we were able to have people outdoors. And so there's a lot more that can be said and has been said, but to me, I think that's the biggest thing that's changed since 2016. And I would just add that there, there are two things that I've been thinking about that haven't come up very much and or at all in the public conversation. Um, one is that we're, I don't think that we're committing um, the school committees and the towns um, of the future to a turf field if we vote to move forward, right? We're committing ourselves to uh, maintaining a turf field. And then after the life of that turf field, 12 or 15 years, the next committees need to decide, do they want to purchase another turf field or do they want to revert to a grass field? And I believe, and Joe, I think might be, you know, you might know more about this than I do, but um, the infrastructure that we put in for a turf field um, would be very similar to an engineered grass field without the irrigation, right? So we know that turf field doesn't need irrigation, but we know that, um, you know, a turf field can certainly be converted. So to me, this is buying a piece of equipment like a trampoline for a gymnastics program. And we know it's gonna get used. That's always my first question is when my kids ask for something, are you gonna use it, right? We know it's gonna get used. We know it's gonna get used by a majority of the kids in the district and by the communities that will have its own bureaucratic challenges, I'm sure. Um, and we, are, we know that we should be planning for either a replacement or for a conversion, right? If, if the experiment is not successful and we want, we as a community want to do something different in 12 to 15 years, it's always an option. Um, and we are planning, you know, for, um, you know, I think there isn't a member of this committee that doesn't want to put money aside, right? I think we're all committed to, making sure that we don't use all of the funds that are left available to us, which is 3.6 million. So if we can have a project for 2.6 million or less, that's a million dollars that we're committing to not using. Um, the other piece that really hasn't come up much in, in conversation, if at all, is that there are companies that reuse turf fields, right? And is it even possible that we could reuse this turf field, repurpose it, use it for something else? Um, or are there companies that could take it and repurpose it for something else, whether it's like tent flooring or you know, other things like that? I mean, if you look it up, you know, we may we're we're hoping that in 10 years or 15 years there are companies that will recycle it. But we know now there are companies that repurpose turf fields. So, you know, I think um, there, there are lots of things that we could continue to talk about, but I agree, Julia. Um, one of the reasons that this was left to the end of the year last year is because we had other things we needed to focus on. We could not keep continuing to discuss this turf proposal. And I, for one, feel confident that it's worthy of you know our support but if the majority of this committee feels otherwise then we should we should you know make that decision and then move on i think we owe it to ourselves and to the community i think if we if we vote against the proposal then we're probably looking at just compliance portion and ada which is about 3 quarters of a million dollars is what we estimated, what Joe estimated looking at the pie chart, which you saw in the minutes. And we're done, right? You know, at least for now. 
you know, until we, we have bandwidth to, to do something. So, oh, uh, sorry, Mike, Christina, Jose was- Oh, sorry. Christina, I've spoken so much. Please, please go. I'll wait. People may not want to hear me either. Um, so I, I hear both of the points from, from Carrie, from Steve, um, and from Julia. And in fairness, in October, I did vote against this. Um, I, consent, I continue to have, um, and while I appreciate maybe equally to most that I would love our our school committee meetings to be prim primarily focused on what the last three hours were focused on rather than talking about turf field. Um, I, I wonder if there's a way to remove the conversation from the school committee um, and recognize that there are still, I've been sitting on this committee for two years, I still have questions. I'm still concerned about the financial outlook, outlook and impact for the future town and taxpayers. I am uncomfortable saying let's spend this money and hope in 10 years we can, we can upcycle the grass. Um, I also wonder what about the infrastructure of all of the other fields that we have on this campus? If we put this field where it's said to go, we still have six other fields on our campus and baseball diamonds that are, you know, the soil is considered poor and there we need to address that. We need to campus-wide address irrigation, drainage, um, you know, digging wells, all of that. And we haven't addressed that in the cost of this. That's not, that's not getting fixed in this bid process. I, there, I don't think there's anyone on this committee or in this community that is going to say, we don't need Title IX compliance and we don't need ADA compliance. We need those. Um, we need those yesterday, but I just, I continue to have the concerns about the financial impact that this is going to have. Um, I, I'm uncomfortable saying we have this money, let's spend it now. Um, and I guess that's all I had right now. Jose? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll start out, you know, just just thinking you, Carrie, and and, and Stephen, and, and Christina, and uh, you know, all of you that have been a part of this conversation for for so long. Um, you know, we're all donating our time to our our, our community, and uh, and and I, being a, a parent who's benefited from it, I'm very grateful. Um, you know, speaking in in following along from what Christina said, you know, it seems to me that there are three priorities, and uh, second two are unclear in terms of how they should rank, but certainly the first being ADA compliance and Title IX being priority number one um, that, that you know, we have no choice but to address. Um, I understand and am convinced that the playing field, um, you know, the football, soccer, lacrosse pitch is, is, uh, is a problem. And I, I'm convinced of that. Um, but then we have alongside that the, um, the track that doesn't exist, um, which is also an issue. And it's unclear to me, you know, why one has higher priority than, than the other. But put that aside, you know, one, one idea that's attractive to me is to approach this in phases. Um, the first phase being, you know, clearly the ADA Title IX compliance. Um, and then down the line, decide what we do about the, the, the turf conversation. My concern about the turf, even if we go to the Brockville, you know, and, and trust that the Brockville is um, environmentally sound and has no, you know, health impacts in terms of what additives or chemicals might be in it, which I, I believe is, is probably true. We still run the issue with the artificial grass, the, 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 the artificial leaves. Um, which are known to contain perfluoroalkyl and polyfluoroalkyl substances. It's unclear how those substances impact health. And I believe that's because the studies, you know, it's, we, we, just, we just don't know enough. Um, so we, by committing to the turf, we, I think we are probably committing to exposing our, our, our kids to, to these substances, which is an issue for me. Um, but 
that that's where I sit right now. And, and uh, I think I'd just speak openly about it for, for, for full disclosure about where, where I sit on this, on this conversation. Michelle? Well, given Steve's, Stephen's detailed minutes, I think it's pretty clear where I stand on it. Um, I, I, like Christina, have um, some significant concerns with the costs associated with this. Um, I, I fear that something else will come up. And then in order to renew this turf field, uh, that cost will then be passed along to the towns. I'm feeling like if this were, if we did not have this gift and this proposal were sent to the towns for funding, it would could quite likely be shot down. Um, and so for me as a representative of Lanesboro and representing my whole town, um, I, I'm, I'm concerned about the financial impacts. I mean, I don't know about I don't know. I don't know about the projects for sure, but if I had to hazard a guess, I'd say that not a single project we've ever done has come in on budget. That's probably a fairly accurate statement. So whatever proposal we get, even if it's close to the 2.2 million, is still going to come in over budget. So I have some concerns that the proposal might be a little bit low to begin with, and then tack on the fact that nothing ever comes in on on budget or on time, for that matter, um, and. Uh, those are my concerns. Um, yeah, I mean, so I guess, you know, the, the gift, as I understand it, was um, to be used for capital projects that would not be paid for by the state. Um, I know it's been said that the administration building does not benefit the students. I disagree with that statement. That is exactly what the capital gift was for. Um, I. In fact, I would argue they probably had that in the parking lot in mind. Um, that said, um, those are my concerns. That's why I'm hesitant um, to approve the field because of the reoccurring costs associated with it. Um, and again, I'm 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 with um, I'm with Julia. I, I I feel like this has taken up a a very large volume of time um, when uh, we have we have bigger fish to fry. Julia? I, can I just ask a, a clarifying question following up on what Christina said that I, I'm confused about what work is in progress already for the all the other fields um, mm -hmm. and what may be needed uh, for those. Mm -hmm. Jared, sure. Can I talk about that? Sure. So the work um, last December, PJC Organics was contracted to um, do an analysis of all of our existing fields. Um, this is a topic that we that we dug into in a fair amount of detail during that October 16th presentation. So there's a whole slide with a bunch of detail there, along with all of the supporting documents on the fields website that was created. So all of that backup material is there. The upshot is that um, they indicated that pretty much all of our I think all of our fields were judged as poor in terms of the quality of, of the existing natural turf. Um, and so the district last year started a process of significantly amending the existing fields, meaning adding lots of nutrients and taking better care of them, trying to make sure they build them up in a way that creates soft, durable, natural grass. Um, that is something that's continuing this year. Um, and so in some that should build up the quality of those fields to a significant level. Um, that does leave two major issues remaining. One is the location of our current game field, John Allen field mm -hmm. is it's probably the poorest location on the entire campus in terms of drainage. Um, it's in a spot that it naturally becomes a pond um, within the campus. That is something that would be very difficult to remediate without effectively digging up the whole thing and putting a brand new drainage system underneath, um, which is effectively also what 
this new field proposal was about. It was about layering in plenty of drainage in a new location so that the old fields could remain um, usable, playable well into the future, but this new field would both be sited in a place that was great as well as um, more maintainable from a, from an, uh, a drainage perspective. Um, and then irrigation is the other topic. Um, currently there is no irrigation for our existing fields. In order to get to a point where we had irrigation for those moments when um, the summers are dry, we would need to go through a two-step process. One is the initial engineering work to um, evaluate possible locations for new wells and do test drilling. Then the second step would be actually drilling those wells, um, running the irrigate, running the, the water supply lines, and then installing irrigation on any fields that we wanted to irrigate using those wells. The reason that is necessary um, is that our current drinking wells are not sized um, mm -hmm. so that they could support that amount of water flowing out of them to the fields in addition to being used by the building. So we need to go through that process of um, developing new wells for that purpose. And how does that get paid for? Is that in the plan now with- that is, that is not, that was not in the RFP that went out right. last year. Um, it, is, it is something that I think we are aware of, but, but it would not be a natural part of a, a rebid of, the, of that project. But it is something that Perkins Eastman within its proposal did indicate that if we ask them to do that, they said there has been discussion regarding the addition of irrigation to the new grass fields. They say new grass fields, but I think they meant existing grass fields. We're aware of the issues surrounding this potential add to the project and will provide guidance as necessary. The fees to design the system are as follows. Design, they, they dropped in 16,200 uh, bidding and construction administration services, 8,700. So that, that was their attempt at, at touching on that subject. Mm -hmm. And maybe if there's background history from other school committee members, I, I'm just curious why that wasn't that hasn't been part of this project before. I mean, that feels that feels like we've got a, a lot of fields that are subpar and we're talking about adding another field. But if we aren't fixing the ones that we have, like it, it doesn't, I, I'm just trying to understand why we would add a new one without fixing the ones that we have. I, I think the, you know, the school committee did vote to allocate funding on an annual basis for the uh, management of the fields. Um, I wasn't on the committee at the time, so I'm not sure what the discussions were, but I, there is an organic management, not an organic management. I'm, there's a, there's a, like a five-year plan that is in place. It does not include irrigation. And I don't think that came to the, um, that was not part of the phase two project. So in terms of these discussions, that is a, that is a different project. Mm -hmm. um, but as you heard, it could be added to this project. And then just building on what Carrie said, I thought in addition to allocating money for these other fields, part of the thinking and part of the appeal of the turf was that this would relieve demand on the other fields and give them more time to recover and get into good shape. Curtis, did you wanna say anything? I do have to admit that I, I find it very hard to wrap my head around uh, putting all of this time, effort, and money into an athletic field when we have no students in the building. Um, I know it won't always be like this, but in terms of our priorities, to have spent this high a percentage of the time just since I've been on the school committee uh, and to be looking at spending this much money, uh, again, from a gift, uh, but to be investing this much in that facility 
when there are s more unknowns than knowns in terms of what's coming down the pipeline in the next two to five years. Uh, feels crazy. Uh, we do have to make it compliant. I, I know that. We do have to do something to address the field conditions because they're unplayable and downright dangerous uh, in many parts. Um, but uh, in terms of just moving forward with the plan as is, I, I have a very hard time wrapping my head around it. Uh, and at the same time, uh, when I when listening to all of the community input and feedback that we got, uh, uh, both both from just people in our community and from specific presenters giving detailed information, I don't feel like I have enough information uh, to to move forward. Uh, with the plan in totality as it is right now, uh, which sounds crazy given all of the time and effort and information gathering <laughs> that's come before me being here. Uh, but that's, so it, that's it, yeah. So it sounds like um, we need to put this th to a vote, and it sounds like the majority of the committee will vote it down. At which point we need to then um, come up with a plan B. Um, there could be an alternative motion um, to pursue just ADA compliance in Title IX, right? Um, there could be an alternative motion to pursue ADA compliance Title IX and uh, existing field alterations. Um, but I think, you know, we need a direction. I, I, I don't, I don't want to be stalled on this. So, and I don't think another, you know, um, yeah, I think, I think the committee needs to vote on whether or not to pursue the turf field. And if the answer is no, we just need a plan B. Yeah, Jose. Oh, sorry, Curtis, I, I was just, you know, in terms of a, an alternative, just, just um, could, could this be a feasible way forward is to, you know, um, Ask for proposals to to get you know to to uh, improve access ways to to the field you know the, to to sort out the ADA compliance Title IX issues and it sounds like the a, a major well a major need is near is the is the issue related to irrigation is that the existing fields um, the they're difficult to manage because we can't ensure particularly you know water during those dry summer months. Um, could that be, does that sound like a feasible way forward in terms of a, a phase one, you know, to address the, the, the conditions of the, of the playing fields and the ADA compliance and, and Title IX? You're, you're asking if that's a way forward. Michelle raised this in the finance committee as well. And, you know, looking again, looking at the pie chart of, um, what within the proposal, what the costs were dedicated to. The um, ballpark estimate was about $750,000 for um, just compliance and um, ADA. Uh, that does not include the irrigation and other studies. So probably between 750 and a million for the two or for all, all together. And just as a quick follow-up, Carrie, the, you know, just just thinking out loud and, and not committing myself in any way right now, just just, just trying to get a sense mm -hmm. from, from all of you about, about um, what the cost would be, you know, by s slowing this process down, taking a phased approach, um, assuming you know, that the, the money that's left over as a part of the gift um, is as well managed and, and, and you know, um, a cruise value as it has, um, the less we spend, the, the more we could potentially have in the future for addressing these issues that, that clearly need to be addressed. Yes, that's by logic, that is, that is the case. I, I would just add that I don't think there is an expectation on the part of the towns, nor that should there be an expectation on our part that we, sh we with this gift should be able to cover all the costs that come our way through this building. Um, it's really just that we'd be able to co cover some of it. 
Curtis, yes. Uh, I do I do want to be clear that uh, in terms of a turf field, uh, just in general, I do support having a turf field at our school. I've looked at a lot of the environmental impact data, the injury data, uh, the fact that it would be one of so many fields and specifically where it's located in terms of uh, runoff and, and, and other concerns uh, in the particulate of the field. I do think it is right to be moving towards putting a turf field in at our school. But I don't know that putting in a turf field when we don't have the funds available to address the irrigation and other needs at the very many other fields surrounding our school uh, is the right move at this time. I think what Jose says about uh, moving forward with making it compliant and improving the condition of the current grass fields and not spending all of the apportioned part of that gift that we had earmarked towards this uh, and sitting on that for another two years or so. And I'm sure anyone listening to this who's been pushing for a turf field is pulling their hair out right now. Uh, but I would urge a, a word that people hate right now, which is patience. Uh, I think it makes more sense to treat the vast majority of the current grass fields and to uh, make it compliant uh, at a far lower sum and sit on that money for a little while with the idea that we will be moving forward with a turf field. Julia? Um, somewhat to echo Curtis, um, both in that I'm sure everybody who has been so patient with us as new members of this committee may be pulling their hair out listening to this. Um, I'm not opposed to turf either. Um, and you know, if, if the issue, and, and Kara, I'm almost gonna parrot you, if the issue is playability, if that's what we're trying to solve for, um, you know, I get why turf is the answer. Um, so I, I don't, by, but, but I do think if we haven't first solved for all the other fields on our campus, um, I, 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 I have a hard time understanding why we would mm. add another one. Yeah, I, I guess I would just, again, um, echo what Steve said, and I think what Joe has said um, and that we've heard before is that the turf field is, or another field is key to the health of the existing fields, right? We really can't remedy the existing fields without another field that allows them to rest. And the, the, in terms of not having kids at the school now, um, I think it's our hope to have, be back in person next year and that's when the field would be ready, would be you know for the next school year. It's not gonna be ready when the school is empty. Um, if we're not in person in the next school year, we'll still be having hybrid, presumably, when um, lots of you know, other potential uses the other factor, of course, is, and I'll just throw this out because it's been mentioned a few times, is the, um, the cost will um, probably, probably, we're told, be lower now than it will be in a year or in two years um, because of the favorability, um, because no one else is bidding, is putting these kinds of things out. Now, I don't know that for sure. I don't have that crystal ball. But we're we're told that the this is a good time to be bidding these kinds of things, um, because those without gifts don't have the money to be spending on this. Right. Yeah, sorry, Curtis, and then Julia. I would be interested in seeing a comparison of some manner of projection of the range of possible increase in in bids. Uh, now versus a year or two out and uh, comparing that with the potential gains on the unspent portion if we do not move ahead with a turf field at this time uh, in terms of the endowment at Williams and just mm -hmm. seeing what those look like side by side. But I don't even know where to begin looking for that at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, Julia? Uh, two unrelated que questions that aren't related to each other. Um, one is there was talk of potentially in the in the Perkins Eastman contract there was talk of a cost estimator. Was that something mm -hmm. that the committee discussed using or no? 
Like, would we, I mean, that might also help maybe answer Curtis's question or maybe, you know, just curious if there was any conversation about that. Yeah, I think the cost estimator comes in um, in the course of designing the big documents before they're put out to bid, okay. right? That's okay. part of the, the process. Okay. Um, the second question, and, and um, again, I appreciate the patience of all of you who've been working on this for so many years. Um, as we try to get up to speed. And I, I feel like often I have to ask a question multiple times and people may think they've already given me an answer when they may, maybe they have, but I haven't been able to process it. So, so I'm gonna ask a question that um, maybe I should know the answer to. I, I thought I heard in a October school committee meeting that um, there may also still be an issue around electrical wiring for the cross country ski team. Is that also a kind of outstanding issue that remains? I remember hearing maybe they would fundraise for it. No? Mm -hmm. We did vote to support the uh, construction of another uh, building and therefore free up the building that was being constructed for cross country ski. So I think that issue was resolved at the yeah, October meeting. There's something about electrical wiring in particular. The, so we have since solved okay. Solved that problem. I, I, I shouldn't speak for the Nordic ski team, but from what I have heard, we have found a number of overhead outlets um, that we actually had on hand from the big building project that will be deployed within this building. Um, and, and that that is at least a, a great, perhaps 80% solution okay. um, to the overall request. But yeah, so I, I would need to reach out to the, to the team and to the athletic director to confirm, but. And I apologize, it may seem like a little thing, but to me, it's part of this big picture of what are the, what are the other ways we may need to think about shoring up what we already have um, versus building something new. Uh, Michelle. So I just have a question. So you just mentioned um, that you approved a new building. Would that also be coming from the gift? Okay. So our gift is at three point, was it four or six? The 3.6 takes into account that roughly $100,000 that would be coming out soon for that facility yeah. storage building. Okay. That's, that was my question. Thank you. Jake, did you want to say anything or do you have any guidance for us as a committee? I, I wish I had deep guidance. I, you know, it's, it's really, uh, it's vital that we provide um, not only kids, but the community with uh, the appropriate places to, to, to do the things that they do. Um, all of us, I'm sure, have recollections of going to school. And, and my guess is most of our happy memories didn't involve taking a test. Um, most of our recollections of lifelong learning and people that deeply impacted us and moved us um, aren't around filling bubbles in on a, on a Scantron sheet. Uh, it's spending time with an art teacher that broadened your horizons or a music teacher or a math teacher or a coach. Uh, so it's really vital that we have as much high quality playable space on this campus as we possibly can. What the right answer is, I do not know. <laughs> but but uh, this, this insistence that we do this and we do it right, and we do it in a way that works for kids two years from now and 20 years from now is really important. Uh, and, and, you know, my, my, my experience of, of uh, 16 years of working with school committees as a, as a superintendent, we, we are going to be spending hours and hours and hours and hours and hours doing um, all kinds of important work. And uh, so, you know, and, and we're going to do the instructional work and the social emotional work and the budgetary work, no matter what else we're dealing with. 
uh, this particular topic is worth worth the time that we're putting into it because it's really vital in the life of our students and the teachers that are that are um, and coaches that are trying to get them from here to there. So I I, I don't have any great answers. Uh, but 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 this work is important and we need to stick with it. Can I make a quick comment? Uh, yeah, I've Steve, had, go ahead. Yeah, I've had my hand up for a while. I'll lower my hand. I'm sorry. Can no, 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 can't no problem. I, I figured you hadn't seen it. So just just briefly uh, recapping you know, a lot of the points that people have made. You know, I, I understand the concerns on both sides, but we do have the funds available. And as has been said, for playability, you know, this is what our athletic director, this is what the people who are on the ground have said solves our problems. The turf solves the problems. I agree uh, more than I think anyone else about the amount of time spent on this. I think I've been on the most committees that have been discussing this issue. I agree with what Jake just said. We're discussing this because it's important. We have tried in the past to resolve this and not have this on this school committee's plate, uh, but we you know, keep postponing the decision. And at some point, and there's been a lot of supporting documents provided you know, that have answers to these questions. You know, the information is there, we have to read it and we just have to make a decision. Um, I, I, I strongly support doing the turf. I'm worried that if we do the ADA and Title IX, we may end up spending money on some things twice and that's not gonna be the most effective way to use our funds. This is a good time to bid. We can do the field, we can you know, set aside $1 million and if the bid comes back too high, we don't have to do it. Joe, in terms of the process, um, if there is concern about the existing fields, does that become an ad alternate? Um, or is that something that we can simply ask to be put into the bid process? Um, the restoration or irrigation drainage of the existing fields. So adding new wells and irrigation to the to the bigger project that would go out is that how could mm -hmm. that be done? Um, yeah. That could be done as a part of this detailed design prior to putting things out to bid. So it's a core part. It, could be placed as an ad alternate conceivably. Um, the important thing about ad alternates is to remember that they're, they are layers of an onion and that you cannot accept alternate three, but reject two. Um, so that's a part of, it's always better to determine what you want and then put your bid documents out so that they detail exactly what you want and in what order you want them. Um, rather than trying to use it as a buffet of various things to decide later. So, sorry, Michelle, just to clarify then, the irrigation and drainage could be added to the project for the additional cost as outlined in the Perkins Eastman proposal. That, that was a cost to design documents for that. Is that correct? Yes, that was now, that was Perkins Eastman, I think, watched the October meeting and put put that into the proposal. It, it, it was not a requested portion of the proposal, which is why they viewed it as an optional thing. Um, the other way to go about that same work would be to um, go direct to a local engineering firm that does well-related work and then take it from there more locally and at a lower level. But along with that needs to come, which fields do you want to irrigate uh, and how, how fancy an irrigation setup do you want, which is something that we would want to have someone who's knowledgeable about that uh, guide the committee on. And how environmentally sound would it be given the water usage? Yeah. Michelle. Um, would it be possible to have, so I guess um, I am a little bit uncomfortable prioritizing stock of cross over track, for example. So would it be possible to have the, the bid proposal include a track 
I would be much more comfortable with that than having it as an ad alternate. Um, so that's one thing. And the other thing is, do we have even a guesstimate as to what it would cost to irrigate the existing fields? I personally have not seen any estimates for running irrigation lines and, and setting everything up for some kind of automated irrigation system. I have not seen any, any estimates on that. I'm not sure if other people have. Curtis? To clarify, if we vote to move ahead with the bid at this point, we still have the opportunity upon seeing the final bid to yay or nay. So absolutely. in light of that, it makes sense to me to move forward with the bid rather than starting over from scratch at this point and see what it comes in at. And while we're waiting on that process, maybe we can send out a feeler, I'm not sure through what venue, to find out a ballpark quote on irrigating the current grass fields and the, the well work that goes along with it. Uh, I know that's almost the exact opposite of what I just said, by the way, uh, but I, if we're able to move forward with the bid now and still have the luxury of time when it comes to making the final decision on whether or not to move forward upon receiving the bid, then that to me seems like the logical thing to do. Does that make sense? I may be losing my mind. This is hour 11 of Zoom today. Yeah, there is also a process of value engineering that happens over the course of developing the big document. So we could say to Perkins Eastman, as Michelle had suggested, we would like to bid the track and the synthetic turf field um, and the ADA and the Title IX um, and not have the track be an ad alternate, but be part of the project. We have the ability to say that. It's already been scoped out and you know, all we do is we put it all together and anyone who bids on it is bidding on the full package. Um, we could have other things that would be ad alternates and there we already have a, a list of value engineering. So there is a whole process. This is just the vote to move forward with that process. There would be a vote on the documents before they hit the street. Absolutely, by the full committee. I did just briefly, I, I strongly support moving the track up as has been suggested, especially when you consider the number of people who use the track and the fact of what the track would be able to give us in terms of you know, people you know, coming to the campus. Julia? Um, I'm, if we, well, first of all, I feel like if we vote, if we move forward with the Perkins Eastman contract, that's a pricey contract. So I feel like we're in it, you know, we would be going out to bid, we're, we're in it. Um, obviously we don't have to take a contract, take a bid that's way out of our budget, but um, it, is a, it is a big step. Um, the second thing is if we were to pull the track in, um, and go out to bid for ADA Title IX, the track and the turf field, and we can't afford that, then we are back to, we, back to ground zero for just the ADA and Title IX, which are required. Is that right? Well, um, so that's where the estimator comes in. If we know what we want to spend and we're above it, then we would start to pull things out. That's the value engineering. Okay. Right? right, that we do before the documents go to the street. So if we say as a committee, we really don't want to spend more than, mm -hmm. you know, X number of dollars, um, we value engineer the project before yeah. anybody bids on it. Okay. You know, we're just saying the track is more important than outdoor or night lighting or, you know, any number of other items. Mm -hmm. Jose, did you have a, I thought I saw your hand. Oh, no, no, apologies, okay. no, no. That's okay. Are we ready to vote? 
Do we have a motion? Not yet. <laughs> it looks like Steve has his hand raised. Sorry, that, that, that was for the previous comment. I was so busy typing, I forgot to lower. But it was a high five. <laughs> yeah. uh, I would move that we vote on this now. Um, so what's the motion? To accept the Perkins Eastman proposal, um, but adding the track as part of the bid, the project that's bid. Yeah. Oh, or did we want to add in the irrigation as an ad alternate? I think we can discuss that without necessarily, well, oh, so that's the additional cost on the proposal. Is that what you're saying? Except that additional cost? Right, so, you know, uh, ideally what I would like to see bid is the ADA compliance, Title IX compliance, artificial turf and a track as the, mm -hmm. and then the ad alternate would be the irrigation to the existing fields. That, if I'm hearing correctly, that covers all the issues with the athletic fields. Um, no? Yeah, although I guess the question is whether we would want to include that as part of this project or treat that as a separate project. Um, you know, working with our local um, landscapers and engineering folks and. Curtis, yeah. Since the irrigation would be, uh, by my understanding, separate from the construction that would be done for the compliance, the turf field and the track, uh, it makes sense to me to move forward with just as what M Michelle described these, these components together in the bid, but to hold out, I mean, if it's possible to just ask them, hey, throw us a ballpark. I don't know how loosey goose these contractors can be with a ballpark estimate, but uh, Michelle loves the fact that I said loosey goosey, by the way, hour 11. Um, but uh, it would seem to me to make sense to uh, treat that sort of separately from this project in that in terms of its implementation, it would be physically separate from this project because we're not irrigating the turf field or the track. Does that make sense? Julia? Um, By the way, sorry, we have a motion, but we don't have a second. So does someone want to second the motion just so we can have official discussion? Otherwise, it just kind of goes away. It's fine. Either way, I'm just asking. I'll start with seconding the motion, um, but I'm, I, I may also now be trying to amend the motion. I'm not sure. Um, I, if we... I, I appreciate the idea of going of working locally for the and maybe for less money for the irrigation piece, um, but I'm worried about and I don't know I don't know how to think about having multiple projects on the property simultaneously that may conflict if they're not being managed together. Yeah. And in addition, I don't know that it's just an irrigation issue versus irrigation and the need to bring in more soil um, and develop healthy soil where we can grow grass. Um, and so I guess my concern is um, we're, I feel like we're missing the, the the total picture of the athletic infrastructure as a whole, its implication as a whole now, five years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now. Playability, our student population is declining. How many people are actually gonna be using these fields? I'm, I'm very uncomfortable um, with this process the way it, the way we're saying let's just let's just spend this forty four thousand dollars and put it out to bid like I, I'm I'm uncomfortable with that because then if we come back and say these bids are ginormous and we we just can't do this we're now again we're back at square one we haven't solved the problem 
um, we haven't defined the problem in its whole, in its in, in entirety. We haven't solved the fact that we don't have a track. Um, we haven't solved Title IX. We haven't solved compliance. Uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Those are just my thoughts. Well, someone else want to address those concerns? Yeah, Jose. No, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll second uh, Christina. You know, I think my, my sense it's you know I th I, I I can get a sense of of uh, and, and certainly we 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 I can feel the impatience from from many members of our our community about um, the situation as it stands. But, you know, money we spend now is money we don't have. Money we don't spend now could mean more money in the future to address in a very gradual, purposeful, systematic way, all the issues that the, you know, recreational playing surfaces and infrastructure face, just as Christina mentioned. And, and, and that's, that's, you know, I, I think I, I, I hear Christina's concerns and, and frustrations. And I, and I think I, I, I share them as well. So I would just say that, oh, Steve, just one sec. I would just say that that's, uh, I, I think that process, I think, you know, we've heard from the folks who were on the phase two committee and we've heard from the folks, some of whom were also part of the first process in 2017 that the athletic infrastructure was, um, I mean, was strategically discussed, right? That's how we got to this point. So I would hate to go through a whole nother strategic planning process where the athletic infrastructure and end up exactly here again, you know, in six months or in two years. Um, then again, as Curtis says, there'll be more money to spend at that point, but you'll have had two years without being able to relieve the existing fields without being able to, um, you know, have another field that students and PE and the community can use. So I think that work has been done. Um, and I, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure um, what could be done um, differently in terms of yeah. Sorry, Steve, go ahead. No, this was good. You, you actually relieved me of saying some things. Um, I'll, I'll just add that when we went to bid last time, we had one bid that would have been in our range, except that they had misinterpreted what was asked for and had an artificial turf uh, also on the softball field. Uh, and then in terms of the bid coming in too high, as you know, Christine and Jose have mentioned, uh, this is the advantage of drawing up our priorities beforehand and saying, you know, what is our top priority so we can choose the ordering. Curtis? This seems almost like a small tangential question, but it's been gnawing at me. I heard a lot of people bring up the uh, issue of snow removal from a turf field and concerns of what that does to a turf field. And I didn't know if that ever was addressed. Uh, and that is something that's like, do we tarp the field and clear it that way? I, I've seen different fields dealt with different ways. So did we yeah, ever- I know there, I know the plan is to not use it during the winter, right? So I don't think there, I mean, we certainly have not budgeted for special equipment to plow snow, which you need special equipment. The goal is to be able to use it in November, and if it snows, it, it doesn't get used, you know, in April. Jake, I'm sorry, did you want to say something? Yeah, I, I was just going to say just what you said, Carrie. I think there's some some minutes that reflect, you know, from the phase two committee that, uh, you know, the, the notion of using this 365 days a year didn't really come from them. It's... Uh, the, the, the not plowing it would extend its life uh, and also alleviate some of the, the concerns around, you know, the, the, some, some of the pieces getting, getting from the field onto places that aren't the field. Um, I would also suggest, you know, in terms of thinking about irrigation, um, 
in installing irrigation and, and you know take this for what it's worth uh, in order for for a an appropriate irrigation install to take place we're going to lose uh, the use of whatever field or fields that's happening on for some time so the so the timing of of when an irrigation system uh, could could be installed, it, it would really, <laughs> you, you, one could make the case that you would almost need a, 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 a imminently playable field in place and then go ahead and consider irrigation around the, the rest of the fields. Just there's, there are some timing issues around the, the multiple projects of that sort happening at one time. So thank you, Gary. Thank you, Jake. Julia? Um, is it, in my mind, this conversation is inextricably linked to what we would want to have set aside in the renewal fund as well, and how much we want to include in this potential bid. Um, and I, I, it's on the agenda, it's the next thing, but you know, I, I don't know if there's a way to embed it somehow in this conversation as well. Um, in that there's a big difference between a one or a 1.5 million. The impact of that difference, you know, really shapes what we could yeah. expect. So I know the, the a, a previous iteration, couple of previous iterations of this committee, um, at what point did put numbers on a vote for a bid and it was um, deemed either not legal or not appropriate. I think, so Joe, I did wanna ask about that. And do, I mean, do you remember that vote or actually Steve might remember when the two projects were coupled, phase one and phase two. Um, so if, in other words, if we say we wanna put a million dollars aside for an endowment and that leaves $2.6 million to spend on a project is that we don't want to include those numbers in a, in a vote because you're then telling people what to bid essentially, right? Christina, do you remember what the issue was? So I, I guess, yeah. You're right, it was, a, it was along those lines. We can set a number for what we set aside in the endowment, but we can't set a number for what we would want the bids to come back as. Right, but we can have that number in our minds, right? And we can talk about not wanting to spend, you know, more than, I mean, that's the reason for putting estimates out. Um, so yeah, there, there is a large difference between a million and a million point five. But again, what, what is the expectation in the community? Should we be really needing to have $6 million in you know, 20 years? Or should we be setting aside you know, enough that we can cover boilers and, and maybe you know, anything that comes up in, you know, within a reasonable time frame? Um. Can I follow up on that? Of course. Um, it's it's not six close to six million in twenty years if we're tapping into it along the way. Like that has huge impact on the total growth. I, I'm I'm a proponent of more than a million. Um, of one point five would be where I would want to start, um, and that's both because. We will need to tap into it. If we if we do something like a turf field, I would want to know the replacement of either a new turf field or to your point, Carrie, a grass, you know, tearing it up and putting in a grass field comes out of this fund. Um, and so that's that's an earlier, you know, drawdown from the account. Um, and I also I but 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 I guess one of my questions around this is similar to that, like what is the how do we think about a long range capital plan and how, do, how is it funded and what would this be responsible for versus other sources? Um, you know, that 
we don't have all the information and I get we're gonna have to make a decision without all the information, but that's another one that is stumping me. But what, what really feels important to me is that we've heard from the towns and we heard from Hugh at the fora to please make sure we set aside, you know, one, I think he was 1.25 to 1.5. Um, and that's, I know it's, I know this is not their decision, but I know, and I know we are our own go governing debate, you know, body with our own decisions, but I do believe the towns are our partners. And that, so I want to think about what they are looking to us to, to do as well. So Carrie, I think we might've lost Steve. Um, he's still on the call. Oh, there he is. Okay. I yeah. couldn't see him anymore. I'm just typing. Yeah. <laughs> we need you. We need to get you an avatar so we can see you. Joe, do you have any thoughts for the committee? You don't have to have any thoughts. So, so many thoughts, but I don't. It, it, if there are any questions that were that were outstanding, then I can certainly try to answer them. But I don't. Yeah. Jose. Um, you know, I think we had the a motion, and I think that motion was was seconded by Julia. I, I don't know if we're in a position or if whether you know we we'd like to continue conversation, but perhaps speaking selfishly from, from my perspective, I think I would welcome welcome uh, a, a vote on this motion. Can we restate the motion for the minutes? I think the motion is to accept the proposal from Perkins Eastman um, to move forward with the process, um, but to include the track in the project and not as an ad alternate. Thank you. Christina, do you want to call the vote? Yes. All in favor? Roll call alphabetically. Last name, please. Yes, I understand. <laughs> Just one. So I have one quick yeah. question on that. Oh, wait. I Joe just has want to a make question. sure the motion, the motion is for the basic services lump sum, so not for irrigation, correct? Right. I think I just want to yeah. make sure I'm on I know what would happen. I just want to know. Mm -hmm. I I agree that this needs to be tackled. I think there have been efforts to address the um, existing fields and, and this committee, it sounds like would make a commitment to continue to do that, just not as part of this project. And I apologize. Um, by saying the track is part of this, we could still choose to go out to bid with just, we're not, we don't really have to define right now what's in the base bid. We would no. define that after a cost estimator. Just Mm -hmm. Just giving guidance. Okay. We need to tell the architect what we want. Yeah. Okay. If we can't afford it, we don't. Yeah. And it the too. architect can give us a sense of the prices. Yes, as can an independent estimator. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Bowen, I. Henry, no. Constantine, no. Elfenbein, aye. Green, aye. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I don't think it really matters. I'm going to go no. Johnson, no. Nay, sorry. Steve, Steve I. Hey, that motion passes for eyes, three nays. So my understanding is that, that that bid goes goes out for forty four thousand, and we end up doing nothing with it. The four of us that voted yes have to pony up eleven grand each. Is that how that works? Uh, no, I I, I put up twenty two thousand because I've been on it longer. It's proportional. Excellent. <laughs> I'm so happy yeah. to hear that. Happy birthday, Curtis! You're off the hook. <laughs> Thank you. Biggest birthday present ever.
Oh, math people humor. <laughs> I've had two birthdays during this meeting, by the way. <laughs> Moving on, please. <laughs> Carrie, renewal fund? Do we need it? Yeah, so it sounds like, I don't know if people want to spend time on this tonight. Um, this is really just um, the, the documents are in the packet. Julia's already, uh, we've already referred to them. We don't have to make any decisions tonight. If people want to make a motion, then it is on the agenda and you're welcome to do so. Yeah, Jose. Thanks, Carrie. Um, I asked this question very briefly at a previous meeting, and it wasn't during the, the formal session. I asked the question of Joe about a capital improvement plan for the building. Um, my understanding is that one doesn't exist, um, but there's a recognition, open recognition, that one is needed. Um, I think this speaks to, I think, questions that Julia had about um, how best to make an informed decision uh, about you know, what money should be set aside. Um, do we know how that process should play out in terms of identifying or producing or, or creating this capital improvement plan, um, how long that would take and, and, and so on? Certainly that would help me, help me um, certainly give me a better idea of what, what this number should be in terms of what, what should be reserved in a renewal fund. In a renewal fund. Joe, do you want to respond to that? Sure. Uh, so far, what we've done is we've just taken a, a quick look at current day costs associated with the replacement of floors, windows, and roof, which are the three single biggest ticket items. Um, if we were to dive into a process in detail with Tim Sears and with outside experts looking at all of the various failure points within the building and trying to use best practices in terms of looking at what, what needs to be renewed and when and what sorts of liabilities we have there. Um, th that's a process that would take significantly longer to do in detail. It's also something that in, in my opinion should be done as a district wide plan because we, we do have a number of costs that will need to be layered um, as we go through the years. And our two elementary schools are also at the point where windows, for sure, at Lansbury Elementary School, are, are a topic, need to be a topic very soon. Um, and costs like those are ones where we need to figure out how to stack them and do them in, in a process that allows those hits to town's budgets to, to not lump up to not be big bulges as we go through the years. So it, the, the best way to go about it would be to look at the district as a whole, three buildings that we wanna maintain as best we can um, and try to tackle each one with a fair amount of detail. Um, at this point, state programs are, are their, um, their once your limbs are falling off, what kind of money can you get from the state to, to try to shore things up? So we really need to look at it locally and at a level of detail that that involves also our towns ideally in terms of what sorts of plans we can try to put in place in partnership with them. So it's a bigger And, topic. and just to follow up on the, the, the regional agreement again, um, because the towns own the buildings, the elementary school buildings and lease them to us for a dollar, um, they are responsible for the repairs um, to those buildings over a certain amount of money. Is it? 5,000 on a given project. So we need to, that's one of the reasons, of course, we need to work with them um, to uh, come up with a, you know, budgeting. Julia? I'd like to make a motion that we uh, plan to set aside $1.5 million for a renewal fund. I would second that motion. Okay. Discussion. Uh, was that, was that, so, oh, wait, sorry, Steve. Steve had, yeah, I had my hand up before the motion was made. I just wanted to say that it's worth remembering that if we vote to set aside a certain amount now, we can always set aside additional amounts later. And thus, I would prefer to vote now to set aside $1 million 
not 1.5. I think there's a motion that's been seconded, so we would have to vote that down, and then you no, can make another motion. Was, but Jose, go ahead. Um, I think I'm, I, my tendency is to be conservative about you know, you know, preparing for future and likely unknown costs. Uh, but this feels a little bit arbitrary in terms of what number we allocate to a renewal fund. Um, I'd like to hear from from you, Carrie, and perhaps from your finance subcommittee members. What what if you have a sense of, of, of what a number should be, um, and why? Yeah, the numbers that we discussed, um, Steve had proposed something under a million, and both uh, Michelle and I had um, had said that we would be comfortable with a million. Um, Michelle, do you want to speak to, you know? why a million was good in terms of yeah so i think i started at 1.5 uh, i think that's my preference however um i would not want to sacrifice the 0.5 i wouldn't want to sacrifice the track for a 0.5 is what i'm getting at there so i'd like to have the money available um should this project come in way under what we think it is um then i think we can add additional money to it as steve is saying but I, I am comfortable with a million. Um, Joe did a, a nice sheet for us with, I think it was a million, 1.5 and two, right, Joe, that you gave us the estimates on moving forward. Um, so looking at those numbers, which I, I don't have in front of me at the moment, because at this point I'm very tired. Um, I, I was comfortable with a million, but no less than that. Yeah, the, it was a million, 1.25 and 1.5. Um, and I, uh, I agree with Michelle that, you know, the, the track was estimated at about 40, 450. Um, so to me, that extra 0.5 uh, represents the track. I, 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 was I was convinced to move up to a million from those arguments and, you know, considering how many people use the track, I think right now it's better to have the flexibility. We can always add more later. Okay, so we can consider an amendment or we can um, proceed with a vote on this motion for 1.5. Jose? What does an amendment look like? What is it in, in this case? Uh, I think, Julia or I would have to change the number, no? I think once it's been motioned and seconded, uh, the committee owns the vote. So the committee, I think, would have to agree to change the motion. I think we'd all you have to You can't vote accept on it as amendment. a friendly amendment? Couldn't we just vote it down and then repropose in a moment? A, a yep, vote? you can. Yep. I would say let's do that. That'll be the quickest and cleanest. Okay. All in favor of the motion presented? Owen, aye. Connery, aye. Constantine, as, as Curtis looks on, I think I have to abstain. I don't, I don't feel like I'm in a position to, to judge. To clarify, we're currently voting on the 1.5 million. Is that correct? correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, okay. Can I, is it too late for me to ask a question? Uh, yes. Good. Then I will vote uh, no, nay. Green, no. <laughs> Johnson, no, but I want to say no, nay, never, no more. I just want to put that out there. <laughs> that sounds like a drinking song. Um, I'll vote no as well. Miller, no. Okay, so that motion does not pass. And Steve, just, would yes, you Steve like to? I, I would like to move that we set aside $1 million for the endowment. Is there a second? Second, second Elfenbein. All right, is there any more discussion on that? I. Sorry, Joe had his hand up. I, I just wanted to make sure that, so the, the things that were discussed at the finance subcommittee meeting were the one, the 1.25 and 1.5, that was looking at past performance 
of the Williams College Endowment, which does not necessarily dictate future performance by any stretch. I just want that, you know, that caveat out there. Crystal and, clear, no. <laughs> and then the, the floors, the roof, and the windows. We, we took a crack at those because they were the big ones. Present day dollars, we were looking at present day dollars between 15 and 25 years from now, the total cost there would be 5.5 to 9 million um, across those three areas of the building. So I, I just wanted to make sure those numbers were um, there for you. Which to me says there, that's why I said there's no way that we will ever cover all of the costs required to keep up this building. Um, you know, the request was that we set aside some money um, in order to help alleviate the cost to the towns. And a million dollars to me is more than some money. Um, yeah, Julia. I don't know if it's a friendly amendment or not. Could it be a minimum of 1 million? Like I'm trying to figure out how I would vote. I don't wanna say no, even though I want more. Well, I, I, I consider this that you can easily supplement this, that you know, we are setting aside now $1 million. That doesn't mean we can't set aside additional amounts in the future. It, yeah. But we, but we have to have a specific number that we're setting aside right now. And that's why it can't be, I think it can be at least right now because we need to know, we need to tell the towns how much we are definitely setting aside. If you want, I'm happy to amend it to to set aside $1 million for the endowment, possibly to be increased later. Well, you know, the other, the other thing is, um, and I, we haven't discussed this in the finance subcommittee, but we may need to talk to council or to the college about designating this fund as, designating this money as specifically as a renewal fund. Um, I mean, I don't actually don't think we need to talk to the college. We can do what with it, and it was for current or future needs. But if there is some kind of an, a, a way for us to legally set it aside, you know, and to only use the principle that might make folks, you know, feel more comfortable with it. I mean, right now we're just saying a million dollars, we're not going to use this. You know, but we're not putting any other stipulations on it. You know, if the roof caves in, we're, we're under no obligation to, you know, not touch that money, um, nor is any other school committee. So there, right now, there isn't any kind of um, structure around that. It's just a, an intention is my reading of it. Joe, you look puzzled. I'm just trying to come, I, I, I think what you're saying is the, the only way to make that operational would probably be to ask the college if it would be willing to amend the agreement where effectively we'd be, at, the current school committee would be asking the college to provide a new agreement that said we are keep, we're starting with a million dollars of the previous gift in it will be managed as a part of the Williams College Endowment and it will be eligible for use in the following ways, that, that kind of thing. Right. Like the, that would, we couldn't pull it out. The minute we pull it out and we have our council start creating structure around it, it's no longer a part of the college's. Um, right, no, you're, you're right. Funds. That's what I was talking about. Yeah. But we can still vote a number tonight and then figure out what the best way is to to structure that. Steve, do you have, Steve has his hand up, Carrie. Oh. Steve? I oh, know, I'm sorry. No problem. Are folks ready to vote on this? Aye. Christina, do you want to call the vote? Sure. Um, all in favor? Um, of the motion made by um, Steve and seconded by Curtis. Owen, um, 
I, I, I want more, but I guess I'll take a million <laughs> if I can't have more. So Bo and I. Uh, Connery, I, same. <laughs> I think for to, to be consistent, Constantine abstain. Alphenbine, I and same. Green I. Thompson I. Miller I. Okay, that motion passes. Moving on to the next agenda item, Carrie, unless you have anything else. Okay, here we go. It's gonna be a quick one, guys. Um School committee workshop date discussion. In your packet um, was a, um, a draft outline of what discussions would happen um, during our workshop. And we, um, we I spoke with um, our MASE rep and Glenn Kucher, and they threw out the dates of January 9th or January 16th. Um, I am anticipating it would be from 9 a.m. till noon. A couple um, of things came up that we would um, perhaps tack on to the practices and procedures section of that workshop. And those are around packet publishing and um, the number of meetings that are held in a month. So I guess I need to get a general idea of which date would work better for all of you. Julia? Either one is fine. Okay. Uh, Steve, I can make either work. Okay. Is this like a full day thing, Christina? Nine to noon. Nine to noon. All right, either day is fine with me. Same, either day is fine. The 16th is better for me. And Jose, furiously looking at his calendar, right? <laughs> you, you got it. Uh, either, either is fine. Okay. All right. Thank you. I mean, um, if either works and the 16th is better than Carrie, then let's go with the 16th. Um, that way everyone is happy. Okay. I do not have any other business. Um, so do I have a motion to move into executive session with no intent to return to open session per MGL chapter 30A section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with Mount Greylock Educator Educators Association, all units. Moved. Seconded. Julia Was it moved. Julia and Curtis? Yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, any further discussion? All in favor? Owen, aye. Conry, aye. Constantine, aye. Alpenbein, aye. Green, aye. Johnson, aye. Miller, aye. 